Good afternoon. On behalf of myself and Senator Angolia, I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Citrus County Legislative Delegation Meeting. I'm not sure exactly how many delegation meetings that you all have had in the last many years, but I can tell you this is the most important one you'll have for 2023. If you all would mind just please standing and bow your heads. Father God, I just thank you for this time that we can gather together under this roof, in this state, under your care. We ask for mercy, we ask for wisdom, we ask for grace in your guidance, Lord, in the things we do to serve your people in your world. And I pray, God, that you continue to strive with this county and the people here and allow us to be able to enjoy the blessings and the fruits of the wonders that you've given this state in our United States. And we ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Actually, before we move into the pledge, uh, I understand that we lost a great man this week, and I would like everyone to bow their heads in a moment of silence for Rep. Masulo's dad who passed away last week. Please. God rest his soul. Just know that we are continuing to pray for you and the family. Love you, brother. Please, the Pledge of Allegiance, hand over heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, we'll start with our elected officials, and first up is Angela Vick, Clerk of the Courts and Controller. Ms. Vick, you are recognized. Thank you, Representative. Good afternoon uh, to both of you. Welcome to Citrus County. It's a delight uh, to uh, see both of you today. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank both of you for your partnership uh, with the clerks of court across the state over the last many years in our efforts to uh, attain uh, sustainable funding for uh, the clerk of court's operations. Thank you, uh, Representative Mazzullo, for uh, partnering with us as a co-sponsor on many of those bills. And hold that thought. Uh, I'm sure I'll be reaching out again in the future. Uh, Senator Angolia, welcome. Uh, I am certain that Citrus County will be well served. Uh, welcome to the delegation. Uh, we appreciate you and look forward to working with you in the near future. I will be reaching out to both of you to schedule uh, additional opportunities to speak about the clerk's bill, to have conversations related to that. You know that my door and phone line are always open. And if there is anything that I can do or the clerks across the state can do in assisting and supporting you in your endeavors, in your service, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do have a question. You're, you're recognized. I don't know. Is this on? Yes. That's on. Okay. Just so cost of prosecution when it comes to judicial. I know you guys handle a lot of stuff and you guys intertwine with the judicial branch. Mm -hmm. The Somebody said that the cost of the prosecution, like uh, there's like a flat fee for misdemeanors and a flat fee mm -hmm. for felonies. Mm -hmm. The question I have, obviously that hasn't been indexed for a while, right? And then the question comes up is, do we increase those fees to more in line with uh, today's dollars than in years past dollars? And then the question is, you know, do you raise those fees and then does it make it harder for somebody to get back on their feet? Um, so that's the judicial and the policy question. My question to you is that if those are indexed and those are raised, does that help with clerk funding or is that or is that in a separate pot of money that does go to a separate pot of money okay. right those are great questions and i would uh, very much welcome the opportunity to expand that conversation anytime you want to sit down Appreciate anytime it. yep thank you thank you thank you next up is ruthie slaybaugh citrus county board of <clears throat> county commissioners miss slaybaugh you're recognized Good 
not used to being on this side of the podium, but good We're afternoon. We're keeping your seat warm. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Board of County Commissioners, welcome. And Senator Angolia, welcome to Citrus County. <laughs> Um, Representative Masulo, on I want to just say my con give you my condolences for your father, and I appreciate that you're here, and you work so hard for Citrus County, and and we all recognize that. Senator Angolia, congratulations! You know I'm a big fan. So proud to have your energy here for Citrus County, and what you're going to be able to do, accomplish for us. And um, I look forward to working with you, and I, as the rest of the commissioners do also. So we're excited for your new uh, position. Thank you. Well, as you know, Citrus County has gone through quite a rather significant changes in the past few months, and it's exciting time to be have this in our county, and I'm proud to be leading at the board this year. The last election cycle brought us two newly elected commissioners, Rebecca Bays and um, Commissioner Diana Finnegan. They're joining for the, she's joining for the first time. I'm honored to also be included with them along with Commissioner Holly Davis. And um, this is the first time ever in Citrus County that we've had a four women board of commission. And, um, and of course I need to mention our lone gentleman, Commissioner Jeff Kennard. <laughs> He's got his work cut out for him. Uh, we have a new administrative team developing quite quickly, and I would like to recognize, to take this moment to recognize and introduce them to you because you will be working with them. Our new county administrator, Mr. Steve Howard. Steve uh, joined our team in November after a 14-year career in Camden County, Georgia. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce Maricel Rodriguez. Ms. Rodriguez, thank you, served as interim administrator for us, and she did a, a fabulous job. And um, tomorrow, hopefully, she will be, um, pending board approval, she will be the next county assistant county administrator. Finally, allow me to recognize Verona Campshower. She manages the county's commission communication legislation um, affairs and she worked diligently to compile this legislative list in the packet you will see 10 priorities that are of the utmost importance to citrus county in the interest of time i'm planning to highlight only three special projects at the top of the list but I have a brief note before I do. As I mentioned before, Veronica worked closely with the commissioners, staff, partners, including our lobbyist, Mr. Gene McGee, who determined a consensus of the county's priority initiatives. This list will be voted on by the board at tomorrow's regular meeting and is not necessarily in order. But I did want to say that because um, my colleagues and I will prioritize and amend and officially approve these requests at that time. I would never bring something to you without the full board approval, and I just needed that to be known. Um, we just somehow didn't get our schedules right with this meeting and tomorrow's meeting. With that said, the first priority is the Inverness Airport Business Industrial Park. We're requesting $9 million to complete the critical infrastructure needed to construct commercial and industrial facilities at the 75-acre business industrial park located outside the city of Inverness. This will allow for the development of the taxiway extension into the park, a screening wall and the remaining roadways, utility fencing, and stormwater management facility, which is needed to complete the project. We expect this business park to be a great benefit to the economic development of Citrus County. My next request would be the funds of the construction of the Halls River Road multi-use path. This 3.2 mile path would run parallel to Halls River Road in Homosassa with US 19 and South Riverview Circle. That would be connecting the residential communities to restaurants, shopping plazas, and various other businesses along the route. 
It will also connect the newly constructed multi-use path along US-19, which will run nearly the entire length of Citrus County once it has been completed by the Florida Department of Transportation. We request that this project be managed and implemented by the FDOT. The county currently has $1 million to contribute, and we, we request an additional $8.3 million, a breakdown of which is noted in our legislative packet. Lastly, the board requests the funding necessary for the completion of Southwest Regional Reclamation Facility, including necessary storage, pumping, and distribution components. The facility is located less than four miles from Chazawiska, a first magnitude springs. And in, this, in, in the priority focus area of the region's Basin Management Action Plan, the BMAP. Upon completion, the Sugar Mill Woods and Citrus National, formerly Southern Woods, golf courses will accept the reclaimed water for irrigation, providing a significant water use offset in the area. The project has an estimated cost of $10.5 million. $2, Two million of this will be funded through Southwest Florida Water Management District Cooperation Funding in Initiative, and the county is prepared to contribute over $3.4 million. We request that the legislator pro provide a con contribu contribution of the remaining $4.9 and change million. <laughs> The board recently adopted a new mission statement as a piece of our citizen-led strategic planning process. The Citrus County community has asked us to manage growth and foster prosperity by prioritizing protection of the environment, environmental assets, the development and maintenance of infrastructure, and, and the health, safety, and well-being of our citizens. By appropriating the funds needed for these three projects and continuing to fully fund and support the other programs, priorities we have outlined, the legislators will be supporting Citrus County in a mission. I humbly ask for your support for the upcoming season session. Excuse me. Thank you. Okay. More of a, a statement. So first, I want to thank you for and I know uh, Jean, I told Jean in advance to make sure that the, um, the governing board approves everything on, on the request. And I just want to let the school board, the cities know that as a state, as an elected official working in Tallahassee, it has always been um, my sort of rule that any requests that uh, be put forth to me, at least, have to be voted on by the governing body. Um, and that's important because I've had times in the past where I would have staff put in directly requests to me, and then I would call the elected official, a county commissioner, and say, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about this project? And they'd never heard about the project. So it's my belief that since you're asking state taxpayer, uh, asking the state for taxpayer dollars, that the taxpayers that elected you all into office you guys are like the first vetting process of that. So I appreciate that. And I just want to let, Thank you. let everyone know that please in the future, I'm going, it's the first thing I'm going to ask is that how, did this go through the board and was it approved by the board? So I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. I, I actually have a couple questions. First of all, I want to thank you for your service to the county. Thank you. I know you work very hard. I see you out on the roads. <laughs> I see you out doing all kinds of things and uh, we appreciate you and, thank you. and all your, all the commissioners. My questions are specific, and I, I also want to chime in on Senator Angolia's uh, comments that once you get the approval, then you can submit your appropriation request, and certainly you can use our office for any help that you might need with the forms. Talking about the Inverness Airport specifically now. Yes, sir. We had had some funding for projects previously for the mm -hmm. airport. Are those projects now complete? I don't believe they're complete. This will be for phase two. They're in the works, though. All right. Do you anticipate phase one completing before you start phase two? That would be a question for staff. And let, let me just tell you, you don't have to answer these questions mm -hmm. now. I'm just bringing them mm -hmm. up for something to think about. Yeah. Do you know? I believe that phase one is complete, and phase two would be um, dependent on these funds. Okay. Oh. Very good. 
and I I noticed you didn't you didn't have a, a match with this one. Is that correct? We have some monies to contribute, but I did not have an amount for the packet. All right, very good. And then just moving on on the Halls River multi use path, I I know the multi use path that we did over in um, Crystal River that actually um, unfortunately was vetoed this year. Uh, was a, a very short portion, and it was almost the same amount of money. I'm just curious, how um, how confident are you on these estimates as far as doing this full full amount, particularly considering going through the wetlands are somewhat sometimes expensive, and if you had any dealings with Swift Mud on if the $250,000 would be enough for their mitigation? <laughs> So at this time, our staff does believe that the 0.25 million would be sufficient for that piece of it. Um, that is a much less complicated road to deal with. Um, however, in this climate, obviously anticipated costs are always a bit of a guess. However, the proportion of the breakdown should stay about the same. Okay. And do you have a match on, on that particular project? Yes. We're we putting a, a contribution. A of a million dollars, I believe. Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, all right. I see that. Uh, as part of the uh, P and E and survey cost, is that yes. what you? Okay, that's not completed as yet, though. Correct. All right. Okay. I don't have any more questions, but thank you so much. For thank you, and thank you for serving our county. Next up, Marine Mo Board Supervisor of Elections, and and before you start, I just want to congratulate you on the wonderful job you did in November. Thank for you. Not just the county, for the state. Thank you. Um, I humbly say this, that my staff is excellent, and I was so thankful to be able to work with the hundreds and hundreds of election workers, the poll workers, and my staff to be able to, uh, to, be able to go through the 2022 elections. Um, I, it was sure a learning experience being <coughs> on the top, and um, we just had a, we had a great election this year. And Thank you for all your hard work, both of you, and thank you for your commitment to our county. And I'm thankful to be here, and I'm thankful to have the opportunity to stand here and, and uh, speak before you. Um, I had laid out a couple of items on the agenda for our um, some of the legislative issues that we're dealing with this year. Um, some of them have to do with our election poll workers. Um, one of them is, you know, uh, Florida retirement system and the retirees, um, they like to, after they've retired from the Florida, um, Florida retirement system, they like to become election workers. Well, they can't do that if, um, if they're just freshly out of FRS. And what we're asking the legislators to do is to lift that requirement on poll workers, to allow them to work for us. There's a, um, a whole slew of election workers that in the retirement system that, um, that want to be election workers, and they can't because of the current law. Uh, these folks are recently out of the workforce, like we talked about, and they're extremely valu valuable to us as poll workers and on our election team. And right now, the, the penalty is very strict if they work within that time frame after they've retired from FRS system. And, and to be a poll worker, it's only, they're only working election day and maybe a couple of days at early voting. They're not taking on an FRS job from somebody else. And I think that's part of the, part of the um, concern there. And the next thing we have is the election poll workers to be exempt from our E-Verify process. You know, the E-Verify process is a new process that we had to start in January. To anybody that wanted to be a worker had to um, fill out forms, and the forms had to be verified at our office. So I had to have 400 election workers show up in person at my office with these two types of ID to work for us for those couple of days they work for us. Well, one of them is uh, proof of citizenship. Well, all election workers must be registered voters, and a registered voter has to be a citizen. And the second part of that is that to work for us, they have to also um, fill out a W-4 form and put their Social Security number on it. So we have that verification for these folks already. And then the third thing is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've been dealing with this year after year uh, for many for many years, and that's the voter information should be confidential and exempt from public records, um, with the exemption of the per persons provided in the uh, Florida Statutes 10162. 
You know, year after year, for many years, I've been working in the world of elections, and I've become very sensitive to the plea of our voters while trying to explain their voter information is a public record. Anything except a deal or a social is a public record. The home addresses, pub, uh, phone numbers, email addresses. The world we live in now with cybersecurity and identity theft, the voters are rightfully concerned about their identity. And so um, that, that becomes, that becomes a, something that we hear in the office every day during election time. You know, if we call a voter and say, well, so-and-so called me, you know, from a, a, a XYZ and they have my information. And, and uh, rightfully so, they just want to be registered voters. So that's something year after year that, that uh, in this new world of cybersecurity and identity <clears throat> theft that, that I think we should take a look at. And um, the last thing is to please, uh, there, there are so many bills that are going to come across your desk with election-related items. I would love the opportunity to give you the most up-to-date information that you, so you can make an informed decision when you're voting on election-related uh, materials and bills. Um, and last but not least, um, I would love you to come by my office and take a tour, see what we do, uh, see what's out there for elections for 2024. I'm excited to be able to come up on three elections this year in the presidential election. Um, well, that's all I have right now today. And do you have any questions for me? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for serving and what you do for the county. Thank you. So just want to go over these real quick for you. Um, so the FRS retirees, election workers without losing their reti retirement, that's basically so you can get it from the pool and they don't have, they're not going to get penalized. That's right. On their retirement, correct? Exactly. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Second one, poll workers be exempt from e-verify verification process. So your assertion on this is that since you can only get from, you can only get poll workers from the pool of registered voters, since right. the fact that they're registered voters, they should have acknowledged citizenship prior to that, right? Yes, sir. So my question to that is, mm -hmm. one of the reasons why there's a lot of talk about the e-verification process is because the other documents mm -hmm. um, have been found to be frauded. Mm -hmm. um, people can make a social security card where they're not mm -hmm. checking a database. They can, um, um, they can fraud the I-9 um, mm -hmm. form. Is it possible, although maybe not probable, mm -hmm. but is it possible for somebody to get a voter's identification card and not be a citizen? I'm sure. Okay. Um, so the voter, inf the third part, the voter information confidential and exempt from public records. Um, so you're saying that all the whole voter file at that point, right, should the be exempt. The whole voter file, except uh, the exemption in one hundred one six two three, which is um, for political committees, political committees, and... parties, candidates who are trying to further the candidacy, and if they're they're on the ballot for that election and they're part of that election, then they're able to get the vote by mail information yeah. and the voter records. Yes. So, first, I'm a big proponent of. Um, making all of the uh, emails exempt. I think the emails are used for nefarious um, reasons and they okay. go to you all and they get that. Mm -hmm. Just want to let you know where we have, um, where we run into problems okay. creating policy on, on this issue is that the way the law is written with the exemptions is a bona fide uh, political use, right? That's, that's like the catch-all mm -hmm. for it. So if you have a nefarious actor out there mm -hmm. who wants to get all the information, if we did public, um, publicly exempt all the records, the concern that we have is nefarious actors are still going to be able to get the information. All they're going to do is form a political committee, which is relatively easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're arguing over what is a bona fide political use. So that I just want you to understand where we wind up running into problems sure. with that. Okay. So... Um, the bad actors who are using it, and um, sure, we get all these calls every once in a while asking us to extend our auto warranties. That's one of the ways that they get their information. They're still going to be able to get that information. Did you extend your warranty? I did not. Okay. <laughs> That's probably the problem here. <laughs> so I just, want, I just want you to know that that's one of, our, uh, okay. one of the things that we always 
bump into policy wise are like, yeah, we can do this. Mm -hmm. And then the problem is, is that the bad actors are still going to wind up getting it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I just want you to know where we're coming from. So that's always a policy question and we're always, you know, bouncing okay. around. That's it. Thank you. I wanted everybody to know that Senator Ngolia is probably the champion of election integrity legislation. And he actually carried a couple of the bills that we passed in the last session as well as the previous session. And I would think that a good bit of the security that we see in our mm -hmm. state and some of the changes, particularly going through the voters' rolls, which I'm sure your office is quite busy at at this point, has to do with some of the legislation that he's proposed and passed and the governor has signed. That's why some supervisors love me and a bunch of them hate me. Okay, that's 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 not a problem here. I'm always I always want clean voter records and I always want to do the transparent um, uh, tra be transparent and have my voter records as clean as they can possibly be. As of January 1, we just picked up a a non-matching $95,000 grant from the election security. So um, from the federal, and so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the grants that come through. Uh, we just have to be ready for them, and we are. We've already submitted our grant paperwork. It came through, I think, on the 15th of December, and it was due by January 10th, and so we have that coming down the road on the pipe for us, and I'm always excited about grants. I've had um, four or five grants since I've been in office, and uh, those grants are so very helpful to us. One, one, one thing that we were going to, um, one thing that we're looking at uh, that we lost through Senate Bill 90 was the use of volunteers in our office. Anything to do with voter education, uh, voter registration, and outreach. And those are one of the things that we're going to go to our legislators with as well. Um, because volunteers in my office, this is how we run our office. We have a group of, uh, they're from our, our poll workers, and they want to come in, they just have nothing, you know, they, they have spare time and they want to volunteer for us. And we so greatly need them, especially in a county our size. And we have lost all that. And so that's one of the things that are going to be on the, in the legislative package for um, hopefully for the FSC, the Florida Supervisor of Elections, as we come forward. You're right. That's yeah, I'm question. sorry, Ms. Chair. I just thought of another question. So what is your opinion on voter super sites? On voter super sites, are you talking about for Election Day? Uh, talking about not necessarily for Election Day, but it could be during early voting also. Well, it's basically what we have right now. For I have, early voting. I have five early vote sites. I opened another one in 2024, I mean 2022, in the preparation of 2024 in our busiest area, which is central, um, central uh, Citrus County over in the Lacanto Beverly Hills area, prepping up for, for 2024. Uh, super voting sites are early vote sites, okay? Anybody can vote there. You just, on election day, you have to go to your precinct. So what about on election day? What is your thought on that for election day then? If you don't mind me going back. No, yeah, no, not at all. Um, th there's good and there's, th there's, there's good and there's bad in everything. You have to have a site that's big enough that you have enough parking. And sometimes it's hard to find those big sites. Um, other things is uh, voters have to travel on election day. There's only two types of people that vote on election day. The ones that are just going to absolutely vote on election day and that's where they're going to vote. And that's great. And they get to go in and vote and, and go home. And right now with as many people as we have in Citrus County um, and uh, increasing population, increasing voter registration, uh, we have 31 polling sites. And as long as our vote by mail and our early vote sites um, pull in their 30 plus percent, then election day works fine at the polling precincts. As far as having the bigger sites, that means the voters have to travel more. Okay? I'm not against it. It's a matter of just finding those buildings for election day. Okay. I wanted to make a comment also about the FRS retirees, and I appreciate that concern probably more so than uh, anything else that you have here, even though I know they're all important to you, because I think that might be something that we could look at We've also had requests from retired teachers that can't do volunteer work in the schools. Okay. And at this time in our state, when it's so difficult to get labor to do pretty much everything, I think it's important that we perhaps look at that and see what kind of modifications we might be willing and able to make. Perfect. And I'm hoping that we can see some legislation come across to have some, some alterations in the FRS that are reasonable and and it would protect the people that are actually getting into the program as well. Thank well, you. Anything else?
Well, thank you both so much. I appreciate uh, both of you coming here and taking the time with us today, and I appreciate you both being in office, and you both have a servant's heart, and I, I thank you for that. And please go get your car warranty up to date. <laughs> <laughs> Sheriff Mike Pendergast, I think I saw you come in. There. Oh, there you are. You're recognized, Sheriff. It's good to see you today. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you this morning or Great. this afternoon? Great. Thanks. Welcome to Citrus County, Center in Angolia. It's good to see you there, and congratulations to both of you again. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to personally thank you on behalf of the 221 sworn members of the Citrus County Sheriff's Office for your awesome support of House Bill 3, which has proved to be hugely beneficial to us as we recruit more colleagues to join the proven professionals who provide law enforcement to our communities across the great state of Florida. Uh, we've reaped some great benefits already, especially that additional bonus of $5,000 to those men and women who determine that they want to join this profession or they want to relocate from as far away as the state of Maine and come down to Citrus County and become a sworn law enforcement officer. And we look forward to harvesting more benefits from that initiative well into the future, as well as the other things that were contained in House Bill 3. Florida truly is, indeed, the most law enforcement friendly state in the United States of America. And to complement your work, I'd like to thank our Board of County Commissioners who helped us out immensely with the passage of our budget so that we could pay a competitive wage to our deputy sheriffs who are working shoulder to shoulder each and every day, not only with their colleagues from the surrounding counties, but the state law enforcement officers as well, who all received a starting pay effective July 1, 2022, at $50,000 a year starting salary. So thanks to our BOCC support, um, we, we've been able to pretty much close the gap on our uh, shortfalls for recruiting, and we're staring down the barrel now of having almost every sworn position in the agency field. Actually, I have enough in the pipeline. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I actually have enough in the pipeline to fill every vacancy, but we're getting a little picky now with uh, what we're hiring before we just decide to uh, take anybody that applies. We're, we're making sure that we're getting the best of the best to come and serve our citizens here in Citrus County. The majority of Florida sheriffs have 911 communication centers in their offices. Some are co-located in the Sheriff's Operations Center, some are in different facilities across their respective counties. And for a number of years, we've entertained discussions about the vital link of the men and women who receive that first call for service, who are 911 dispatchers and communications officers, those professionals that work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, like our sworn law enforcement officers and our firefighters and our EMS folks. And there's been a movement around the country, as well as right in our own halls in the state capitol up in Tallahassee, to declare our 911 telecommunicators, communications officers, or those communicators, uh, like my colleague right here, Mr. Mike Story, who was our communications center manager for the Citrus County Sheriff's Office, and have them established as first responders which would then allow them to be in the same category as law enforcement officers, firefighters, and EMS uh, professionals whenever it comes to some of the healthcare benefits and some of the long-term things uh, that are associated with their profession. Um, there will be uh, many folks that talk to you during the legislative session and perhaps the committee weeks that talk to you about that draft leg legislation that staff has laid up on your desk for you to take a look at and the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, the National Emergency uh, Number 911 Association, and also the 911 Coordinators Association of Florida. All three of those associations plan to storm our, our uh, capital during the committee weeks and session to attempt to garner support for this draft legislation that was introduced back in 2021 it died in committee, I think, on one of the last couple of days as uh, bills could be introduced and did not make it out of committee. Um, but we would 
respectfully request that you take a moment to review that when you get back to your offices and have an opportunity to uh, reach out to myself or Mr. Mike Story here uh, to talk further about it. But what we really want to do is make sure that we don't forget these unsung heroes who are often sitting in a communications center and never get to see the public like the rest of us do, um, that we don't forget them and we give them the proper um, things that they need as they deal with the effects of a career of many, many years, uh, sometimes 25 or 30 years uh, working in a communication center to support all of our first responders that are outside of the building uh, answering those calls for service that they receive and they work so valiantly during man-made disasters, natural disasters, or those terrible 911 calls that we get like the one we got right before Christmas where a 20-year-old woman murdered her uh, uncle uh, on the front uh, yard of her grandmother's house over in Beverly Hills. Uh, with that, uh, gentlemen, if I could answer any questions for you, I'll punt them over to Mike because Mike's truly the, the unsung hero here today who represents all of those uh, great communications of which we have 51 positions in the Citrus County Sheriff's Office and countless thousands more across the great state of Florida. Senator, you have one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, thank you for all that you do and happy, happy National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day to, to thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, so, one, a couple questions here. Number one, where's the FSA on this bill? Florida yeah. Sheriff's Association. Well, we, we have not had our final discussions on that. It will come up at our winter meeting in a little over a week, uh, Senator, and we will bring that up. It's not one of our top three priority bills for this session, but we did bring it up. It just didn't make it past the top three, which is what the entire association gets behind and supports. Then my next question is, and I don't have a computer in front of me to cross-reference the, uh, uh, the statute. Is this an FRS special risk? A, uh, special risk category bill? Is it a PTSD bill? Is it a workers' comp bill? It, it would be a workers' comp bill. Okay. It's already covered under post-traumatic stress disorder in a previous uh, piece of legislation that passed a couple of years ago. I don't remember the exact citation for that legislation, but they already get the post-traumatic stress uh, disorder benefits as passed by our legislature, I think, three years ago. I think it was about three years ago, yes. Senator, but the actual classification as a first responder is still lacking. Okay. And that opens it up for what? Like, what is the statute adding it? What is it? What is the benefit to the... The, ben the benefit is, one, it'll help us out with retention as well as recruiting to have them classified the same as our law enforcement, fire, EMS, and paramedic professionals that are out there. I want to thank you both for your service, and, and I do want to say I believe we looked at that PTSD bill last year as well, and we, I think we did some modifications on it. I don't know if that actually got put into practice. Do, do you know? Go ahead, Mike. The current Florida statute, um, 111.09, uh, does have the peer support for responders, um, and it does include that in uh, the Florida statute 401465. So that is in there. However, um, it doesn't define everything that if they were classified as a first responder would. Okay. Now, go ahead. Now I'm confused. So you said it, you have the peer to peer counseling that's part of the PTSD bill, right? And then you have, but you're saying that it's for first responders, but then this bill is going to be adding it to the first responders. So what if it sounds like it's not included because it's, if it's not under the definition, because everything in the legislature, unfortunately, is definitions, how you define everything. Correct. So it's correct, it, sir. I'm sorry. It is not in the definition uh, under the first, because we are not included in the first responder definition. So then the PTSD benefits do not flow over to 9-11 no, communicate. It's, 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 it's a separate. Okay, all right. But they didn't put it in the original documents. Gotcha, okay, I understand.
Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very God much. bless you and good luck up in Tallahassee. God bless you. Uh, Doug Dodd, Citrus County School Board Chairman, and Dr. Scott Hebert on behalf of the Superintendent Sam Himmel. You both are recognized. Good afternoon, Senator Angola and Representative Missoula. Uh, my name is Scott Hebert. I'm here on behalf of Superintendent Sam Himmel, who was unable to be here today, along with Chairman Douglas A. Dodd from the Citrus County School Board. I want to thank you for this meeting today and listening to um, our request. I provided for you in a packet um, the request for the Florida Association of District School Superintendents and the Florida School Board Association, their legislative platform um, for you as well. Mrs. Himmel's message to you today was she wants everything. And she said you would understand that when I shared that with you, that she wants it all. So just give her everything she needs and we'll be ready to move on. One of the challenges Citrus County currently faces is finding teachers. When people ask me what is the best way to overcome learning loss because of the pandemic or improve student learning, the answer it starts with is a certified teacher in every classroom. Citrus County is very proud to say that we started the school year with a certified teacher in every classroom. However, as of this morning, we have 45 open teaching positions. So to help address this need in Citrus County, Citrus County is having another career fair on February 7th to find employees already living in Citrus County who want a job in our district. An initiative that we've been very proud of in Citrus County is we partner with a local university and it's called the Paraprofessional to Teacher Program. This is an opportunity for employees that work in the school system to become certified teachers if they choose. Since we began this program four years ago, 17 staff have already finished the program and have become teachers or are currently in the process of pursuing this wonderful opportunity. Additionally, we are in the initial stages of looking at an education academy to support those high school students who choose education as their profession. And if you've looked at any of the research statistics out there, um, there are not many students going into education at the college level. We want to try and change that and turn that around by starting and, and attracting our high school students into that program. Citrus County believes that many roads can lead to success. A student following a CTE or career and technical path has just as much chance for success as a student following a college path. Both are great options. Over the last several years, Citrus County Schools has worked diligently to expand its curriculum with more career and technical education options. On the Gulf, we have the Academy of Environmental Science, an A-plus charter school that focuses on hands-on learning and how students become good stewards of the environment and other STEM-related fields. On the west side, Crystal River High School is home to the Academy of Health Careers, whereby students can earn the skills necessary to get a job after school from nursing assistants to veterinary techs. Crystal River is also host to the Phil Royal EMT program, a program provided in partnership with the College of Central Florida. This sequence of dual enrollment classes enables students to become emergency medical technicians. In the middle of our county, Lacanto High School has begun a welding program. They have also received an endowment of $100,000 from the Davis family, pioneers of Citrus County, for students interested in agriculture. And on the east side of our county, our technical college, with Lacucci Technical College, offers 22 different career and technical programs for students to choose from. Finally, Citrus High School here in Inverness has the Academy of Computer Science and starting this year, a new construction academy. This construction academy was a joint effort between our school district and our partnership with the Citrus Construction Academy, a not-for-profit program with the Citrus County Building Alliance. Over 160 students applied for the very first year to be a part of this academy. We are excited to resubmit our request this year for financial aid to help us to continue the development and expansion of this construction academy. I would like to now turn it over to Chairman Doug Dodd, the chair of our school board, for his comments. Good afternoon. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity that we have to come speak with you, and congratulations to both of you for your terms in office. Uh, Senator Angola, we look forward to working with you, uh, Representative Masulo. Uh, uh, you've had a great history of working with the district and, and communicating with us and finding out the impact of different potential legislation may have uh, in our district. So we appreciate that. Our door is open to both of you and feel free to reach out to any of the board members or the superintendent and we would be glad to welcome you and any of our schools at any day uh, to come out to Citrus County. Um, school safety is a priority um, in Citrus County. 
Uh, we have a, a wonderful school resource officer program through the sheriff's office, and we have a guardian program where we employ guardians to serve as a secondary um, uh, person on campus, armed, trained, and ready to respond in case of an active assailant. And that brings a great level of security uh, to our students and our faculty and uh, a great feeling of relief to our parents that we have not just one armed personnel on campus, but we have two people ready uh, to engage an active assailant. That is a, uh, a great program we have here in Citrus County. We're gonna continue to, to, to look at ways that we can fund that and to grow that program. And I would encourage you as you look at safe school allocations for school districts, especially those districts that are employing guardians, uh, that there could be um, an increase in that funding. I serve on the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Commission, and I would be uh, uh, welcome to you all to act as a resource should you need any information regarding uh, the incident at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas um, High School um, and the work that's being done to provide safe schools throughout the state of Florida. Uh, I will tell you that uh, legislatively, we are required to have a school advisory council meeting. It's required in legislation. Uh, one of the recommendations we're going to make and that I've discussed at the Stoneman Douglas Commission is that we should re require uh, school safety to be an agenda item at every uh, meeting of the uh, School Advisory Council. It'd be an easy little add to legislation. We also believe in Citrus County and the power of parental involvement. We encourage parents to be actively involved in the education of their child. We follow the Parent Bill of Rights and the Parental Rights and Education Act uh, to the full. We continue to focus on career and technical education. Dr. Hebert talked a little bit about our academies, our construction academy, um, which uh, we're gonna continue to seek funding for, but it's a great program. It's at Citrus High School. We also have our com uh, computer science academy um, at Citrus High School, our art academy at Lecanto High School, the IB program at Lecanto High. All these things we offer uh, to students as another opportunity uh, for an education and for a career immediately following um, high school. Um, our board, again, looks forward to working with you. Um, I would like to mention that uh, two of our board members are here with us today. Uh, Thomas Kennedy, the vice chair. Uh, where's Mr. Kenny? Thomas. Um, and he's also the president of the Florida School Board Association this year. And you have the platform from FSBA that we've shared with you. And also, our, newly, our newest elected member of the school board is uh, Joe Faraday. And I did see Joe. Where's Joe? Joe Faraday is also here with us today. So um, we look forward to working with you and uh, feel free, like I said again, to come out anytime uh, to visit in our schools. You're recognized, Senator. I just want to ask uh, Thomas Kennedy a question. <laughs> yes, sir. How did you Boston Red Sox do this year? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that. That's good. Thank you, Senator. Well, I want to thank both you gentlemen for the fine job you're doing. There's a lot of school boards and there's a lot of school districts in the state, as you know. I'm biased, but I tend to think Citrus County has two sluggers, both in the school board and in the district. And you guys do a, a remarkable job. And I'm not just patting you on the back. We've seen, as you have, a lot of school board members that were replaced by our governor because of uh, the fact that the philosophy that they have for their students we do not believe is in the benefit of the students. You can't say that about Citrus County. You are all doing a wonderful job. As far as some of your priorities, I can just say, and I'm sure Senator Angolia will, will chime in on this, stay tuned, because you're gonna see a lot of exactly what you want, hopefully, coming across as policy. And when it starts, I would invite both of you to come to Tallahassee and put your <coughs> opinions in, because your advocacy is vital to us crafting legislation that works for our students. There's no bigger priority that our state has is to provide for its citizens, and that starts when they're very young. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next is uh, Mayor Bob Plaskett, and I see Eric Head is probably representing him. And uh, do you have uh, Cabot McBride here? From the council? Unfortunately, uh, today, uh, Representative Masulo, the mayor, and uh, Council President McBride could not be here uh, at the last moment. So uh, they threw me into the game. So well, you're, you're I'll, more I'll than recognized. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, and, and welcome to the city of Inverness and in our beautiful downtown, small town done right. It's a pleasure to uh, have you, Senator Angolia, be our uh, representative for this district. And Dr. Basula, you've always been a, a great representative of the city of Inverness. We mailed to both of your offices our approved uh, by way of consensus approval of the city council, uh, a local, uh, prior, local delegation priorities letter, which outlines a number of things that the city uh, has remained constant and focused as it's come through the last several years that we wish to impart to you all as you uh, do your good business in Tallahassee. I will just uh, pull from there several things without going into great detail for the sake of time. Um, we remain focused uh, and, and, and believe that you all as well as to transportation is such an impact to our community here. Um, we are seeing more and more traffic on our, on our local highways and streets and the focus to things like the widening of US 41 North remains a, a large priority, not only, I believe, to the city of Inverness, but to Citrus County as well as the MPO. Uh, the funding and the ability to see that project through beyond uh, its current first phase of construction is something that's very important as, as we see transportation and that economic corridor uh, develop. Um, as it relates to small cities, you know, Inverness is a small city, one of over 400 cities in our great state. You know, we always look at the opposition of any erosion to home rule. I uh, don't have anything specific that I would point to you in that, but uh, sometimes the devil's in the detail as you, as you admire through bills and things that are put in front of you. Again, transportation has a, a double-sided coin for the city of Inverness that's not only the economics of cars and trucks, but also multimodal. As we look to pedestrians, as we look to bicyclists, those are ways and forms of transportation that people in our community are finding their way to jobs. We're a service-based economy. Uh, though this isn't necessarily a bastion of, of high earning, it is a circumstance where you can have a high quality of life at affordable cost. And that comes by way of creative transportation for a lot of our service workers. Uh, and there is a strong focus to healthy living in our city. And we attract a large amount of investment as it comes to future residents and folks that want to be here. And projects like the West Inverness Trail that we have brought before the legislature in the past, we intend again to bring to you uh, this year. In tandem with that, our facility at Whispering Pines Park, uh, what a wonderful jewel it is of almost 300 acres of a regional park facility. And it is uh, becoming more and more of a, a focal attention point as people find our area and, and it's an escape from the reality of, a, of the urban environment. You, you can close your eyes as you walk in there and you think you're a thousand miles away from anywhere. But we're seeing a, an enhanced visitorship. We're seeing the need to, uh, as the highway widens on 41 North, uh, and, and again, in keeping with the multimodal transportation focus, to look at uh, amalgamating an entrance for that park as part of the 41 project. That is already started in by design. Uh, we will be coming to the legislature for an appropriation request, again, that was approved in part of, uh, of this process uh, to assist the city with the city coming to the table with dollars to construct a road into that park from the currently approved stub out entrance point on 41 North. Let me shift to public safety for a moment. It's, it's paramount in what we do as a local government. Um, we are not a big public safety agency in terms of numbers, but we have a big effect. Small, we have a fire department. We currently contract our enhanced law enforcement services to the Citrus County Sheriff's Office. But as it relates specifically to the provision of fire services, you know, small fire departments uh, have to remain competitive. They have to remain autonomous and they have to remain in the ability to seek certain programs and funding as it may relate to the uniqueness of staffing a small department. So we just ask that anything that may come across your desk that looks to bolster those types of departments that you support. Finally, let me say that uh, the environment is is huge to Citrus County and the city of Inverness. You know, it is, it is an absolute wonder to live here and be able to work and enjoy what God's created around us. Uh, we seek to continue in our efforts uh, looking at septic to sewer. That's been an amazing program for the city of Inverness. We appreciate every dollar that has been appropriated to us by the state through the various grant funding. Um, those projects are going to be the future, not only of, of Inverness, but Citrus County as a whole as we look to have smart growth principles as we look to protect what is an amazing spring shed uh, and opportunity for folks to enjoy our, our natural environment. Uh, on behalf of the city council, uh, I know that today we have Councilman Davis 
and Councilwoman Lozanich in the audience, as well as our city clerk, Susan Jackson. Um, we, we appreciate this opportunity. We appreciate the ability to be able to come just door, steps from City Hall and have this conversation with you all. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions uh, and I'll do my best. We, we don't have any questions, but we thank you and look forward to those appropriations. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Mayor Joe Meek from the City of Crystal River, as well as Ken Frank, the City Manager of Crystal River, and you're both recognized. Thank you, sir. Representative Senator, thank you very much for allowing us to be here. I am joined by Mr. Frank, our City Manager. Want to start off by congratulation, uh, congratulating the Senator. Thank you so much for all that you do, and congratulations. We're glad that you are here, and as a fellow builder, I'm glad that you're here, and bring that business background and all that you do for our state. So thank you very much. Representative, thanks for all you've done for Citrus County. Uh, for a number of years, we're grateful and uh, we appreciate it. And we look forward to working, continue to working, uh, work with you both. Want to point out a few things publicly and thank you all uh, that you all have done uh, this past year. Fully funded our river walk, which I'm excited and proud to say we are now in permitting for that and hope to be in construction or under construction uh, very soon. But because of the funding from the state, we are able to do that, so thank you. Through the funding that you've given to save Crystal River, the continued cleanup of the Kings Bay and Crystal River is happening right now. Millions and millions of dollars in the bay is looking the best it has in 50 plus years. Uh, and it's amazing what is going on, and that's a direct result of the funding that you all provide us. Numerous septic to sewer projects we are undertaking right now. Again, that's a result of the funding that you've provided us. And then the resiliency funding that you all have passed this last year uh, was a major thing for our community, a coastal community like Crystal River and the opportunities that that presents. So we will be and are following up on a multitude of things that that resiliency funding will bring about. So thank you so much. Uh, this next year is a special year for Crystal River. We turn 100. And so we are going to have numerous events and projects and we'd be honored if you all could uh, be a part of those. And we, we have a little pin for you. We're not trying to buy your stuff here, but <laughs> here, here's some, uh, yeah, okay, yes we are. But so uh, you will be getting invitations from us throughout this year. So we're excited about that. Uh, Ken is going to get into some detail on, we just have four items this year that we're going to go over. Uh, uh, this evening, actually, at our council meeting, we will be approving our actual legislative ask. So any appropriations or anything that we ask for with regards to a money, Senator, to your point, excellent uh, uh, policy. And we'll make sure that we have the full buy-in of our council before we actually present anything official to you all. Uh, also, with regards to City Hall, uh, that's more than just us right now wanting a, a new city hall or a new building. Um, our current city hall is 50 plus years old. It's under the flood. It's in the floodplain. Uh, if, God forbid, we have a storm like you, we saw in South Florida, uh, we're in a world of hurt you know, from an operational standpoint. So that's a priority of or, uh, ours to make sure that uh, from a continuance standpoint, we'll be able to do that and we're moving forward with that. So thank you all very much. We appreciate it. Mr. Frank will give you an update on the four items. And, and thank you for recognizing us, uh, Representative Masulo and Senator Mongolia, and welcome to Citrus County. As, as Joe had mentioned, we, we have uh, simply four items. It's actually three and a half. It's a uh, six-point font, no, no, um, <laughs> no margins here. Uh, so first, as the mayor mentioned, is City Hall. Um, our, our City Hall is, is well over 50 years old. It's in the flood zone. It, it, it has flooded numerous times in the past. Um, it's, it's time to move on to the next step. Unfortunately, due to the cost of construction, just the cost of a new city hall is beyond the city's reach. Uh, based, based on uh, your uh, discussion earlier today, I will be re revising the request to the city council and asking for a match. Uh, what we're asking for this year is money for design and permitting. Uh, next is uh, last year, the legislature passed um, and the governor signed uh, modifications to Florida statute 327.4108. And what that did was put in place opportunities for the counties, and I say counties, to establish anchoring restriction areas based on certain conditions being met. Uh, with all of this restoration we've done with the seagrass, uh, we're seeing more and more boats anchoring in areas of Kings Bay that's causing detrimental damage to that eelgrass. We're asking for a minor revision to that statute to either allow the counties to delegate that to a city 
Um, and this county has already offered to do that. It's just the legislation does not permit that to happen or actually give that authority to the cities to do that. Can you get what's in that, please? Yes. Because I, I helped uh, work with Missoula to get it in on the House language with, uh, I believe it was Representative Saroy who was carrying that bill. We'll talk to him about making that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, yeah, maybe we can sidestep all this. There's, um, you know, we, we, we just want to be able to have our fate in our own hands. So, Was uh, that the half? <laughs> <laughs> that's not the half. No, no, no. that's not the half. Uh, the, the next is, is, is really focused on, on a bigger topic, and, and um, Eric had mentioned it earlier, just the protection of our home rule specific to short-term rentals. I know short-term rentals is always a hot topic up in the legislature. Um, the issue we've got with short-term rentals, number one, the city's got a, a minimum stay of, of 90 days in a short-term rental which we would actually like to tweak that, but we can't. Um, if, if we modify the frequency or duration of our code of ordinances, we lose the entire statute. There's certain areas in the city where we would welcome those, um, but the attorney general has already told us if we change anything to do with that statute, we lose all of that. So we would love to see uh, a, bill, a bill introduced that would actually push down some of that local control back down to the cities. But at a minimum, we would request that you all protect our home rule and, and don't take any other controls away from the cities regarding specifically short-term rentals. What I'm seeing is if you, if you look at studies out there, uh, you hear a lot about unruly behavior and whatnot of neighbors of, of you know rowdy tenants staying next door to a house uh, where your grandmother lives. What we're also seeing, uh, not in City Crystal River, we're trying to avoid it, is as these properties become income producing, they become much more valuable and it's actually outpricing residents within the cities to where they can't even afford to live in their own city anymore because the property values are going up so much because they're income producing. And last, um, the school board had discussed the Academy of Environmental Science. It's my understanding that they're going to be approaching the legislature for uh, some funds this year and the city of Crystal River uh, would fully support that uh, pending ratification by our council at tonight's meeting. Um, so if you would indulge me here, this is the second time I've heard the phrase home rule uh, at this. just want to let you know where I'm coming from on this. Um, so I get the prospect, I get the, the idea of home, home rule. You know, the closest to the people is supposed to be the best government. But one of the things, and I'm just speaking for myself here, I'm not speaking on behalf of the legislature. Um, my concern with the argument of home rule is this, is that you, in order for a city to be incorporated, you have to come to the state, you have to ask permission, right? And what we've seen time and time again is, is areas coming to the state to be incorporated, and then all they do is gouge the residents, right? Yes. And this is a big problem. This is a big problem for me as I see it, because you know, everyone's like, hey, we have home rule. It's like, you come to the legislature, I'm not saying you, I'm just no, talking about no, cities, we, you come we, to the legislature to become incorporated, become incorporated, and then you want to create your own fiefdoms and then uh, erode on people's rights and make it harder to work and all this stuff. And then everyone acts surprised when the legislature, <laughs> you know, all of a sudden yeah. comes up with a new law that actually stops them from doing this, right? And most of the time, it is the larger, bigger, um, more liberal cities, the more progressive um, cities that are putting all of these hurting on businesses and, and residents, right? And we normally don't have a knee-jerk reaction to it. We normally will talk to the Florida Association of Counties, the League of Cities, and we say, hey, look, you need to get this county in line. You need to get this city in line, because if you don't, you're going to see a preemption bill, and then you're going to be complaining about home rule, okay? So I understand where you all are coming from, but from our standpoint, from, a gov from my standpoint, from a governor's st governor standpoint, is we are reacting to bad actors, so what I would encourage the, the League of Cities to do and the Association of Counties is when you're in your next meetings and you see bad actors sitting around and their city managers are strutting around eating their, uh, eating their, um, um, their, you know, their croissants and they're Long drinking bottles. their lattes. <laughs> you good. I'm, I'm dead serious. Go up to them and say, hey, why don't you, why don't you cut your crap? Because you're going to cause us to have to sit there and argue home rule, you are hurting us. If we had more of the cities and the counties 
governing and, and regulate and pushing back on them themselves, you'd probably see less and less of this stuff. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. And just to echo what you said, I, and I know you know this, Crystal River and, and Inverness as well, it's the further, furthest thing from that. We're not a big government, heavy-handed organization. We pride ourselves on being the opposite of that, but I totally agree. Unfortunately, others make it put us in a situation where we're, we're lumped in with that. But uh, to your point, absolutely, as much as we can advocate for that, that uh, some of these other municipalities get themselves uh, in line and and get their houses in order. We're all for that. Yeah. So, so like the the, uh, the the short term rental issue. When I first got elected in 2014, my first session was in 2015. Short term rentals um, were a thing, and the reason why everyone was so concerned is I believe. Don't quote me on this. Don't quote me on this, Mike Bates or Mike Wright. <laughs> <laughs> Bates. Yeah. Um, that I believe it was the city of St. Petersburg was charging people ten thousand dollars a <laughs> right. day as a fine. Yeah, that's how that came up. Yeah, right. So, it's my belief that the DBPR and some of the elected officials tried to work with the city of St. Pete, and they just wouldn't budge. And then right. it comes to this is a point. It comes to the budget where we actually have to follow a preemption bill. Yeah, to absolutely. I mean, that makes complete sense. In our case, we're actually would like to get less restrictive than what we are grandfathered in right now, with regards to the ninety days, and as Mr. Frank said, certain areas in the city, and just pull back some of that regulation, but if we're, from our understanding, and we've, like you said, we've gone from a legal standpoint, tried to do that without complete loss of any type of oversight, that's the issue. So we would love to pull those reins back and actually make it less restrictive. And so that that's our issue right now, but I totally get your point. I mean, you have to do that when you have a, you know, a city that's out of control and, and you know, doing crazy things. Uh, Senator Angolia is a city killer, just so you all know. <laughs> he was one of the few legislators yeah. that actually stopped uh, a city. I can't I remember. remember. City. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but, but he, he also isn't quite as familiar with the good work that yeah. you all do in Crystal River and Inverness. I just want to make a comment about the uh, resiliency grants. Mm -hmm. There's $100 million a year in the budget that we have for those grants. To date, they're fairly underutilized. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, invite you to look at those mm -hmm. as far as getting support for some of your appropriation projects, particularly areas that are in floodplains that you want to elevate or move. And uh, I think that you would find that that would be a, a, a source for at least alternative funding, if not supplemental funding, for some of the things that you want to do. And I would invite other government entities, even school boards, to look at those grants as well if they have any application. Because again, it's something that uh, uh, we might as well get as much of that money here in this area as we can. That's at least my opinion on no, it. No, that's great. And we're actually in that process right now of doing exactly that. We're going through all the uh, different opportunities that are out there and, and we'll be taking advantage of whatever we can with regards to that funding. So. And, and again, uh, I'm not sure we're going to have a bill on uh, vacation rentals this year. I know last year it went back and forth, but if there is comments like you just gave, Mayor Meek would be very important to hear in the committee. We'll, we'll be there. Thank you both very much. We appreciate right. it. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start uh, the uh, time in our delegation meeting where we'll have public testimony. And uh, if you have not signed up and you would like to speak, um, my two aides, Dorothy and Adele, are in the back. And please feel free to go to them and, uh, and sign a, uh, a uh, speaker's card. And we'll have you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Also, um, for the elected officials that are still in the room, I want to introduce my office. Ladies, if you can stand up. This is Marissa Amato and Hannah Christian. They work in my office. If you guys need anything um, as an elected officials, please reach out uh, to them as well as me. Thank you, ladies. And just to let you know that if this is for the elected officials and this is for everyone sitting in the office. I am very, very easily accessible. I know we're going into public testimony, so I just want to lay this groundwork here. Um, I check my own emails. So if y'all need to get in touch with me, 
just go on the state's website, email me, all those emails come to my phone. So I will respond. And if it's something that needs the attention of the girls in the office, I will, um, I will send that off. And that also to any, um, any constituent, any citizens, if you need to get in touch with me, just email me. I'm the one I answer messages on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, direct messages. So I am always accessible. I may not get back to you right away. Um, but I will get back to you. If you're asking me for questions or input, I will respond. Um, if it's just a general statement, say, hey, I want you to vote yes or no on this, then I just take that into cons consideration. So I just want you guys to know that before we go forward. All right. And another thing with the public testimony, you all have three minutes. And uh, we hope to hold you all to it, so be concise. Yeah. First up is uh, James Henningsen. He's the president of the College of Central Florida, and you are recognized. It's good seeing you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Always a pleasure to see you both. And uh, Senator, welcome aboard the team. We've got a great power duo here and uh, looking forward to great leadership again up in the legislature. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and myself, uh, again, thank you for all your great work. We want to let you know a few notables about your college, that your college continues to be ranked the, one of the best colleges in the country by the Aspen Institute for college excellence. Your college was recently rated the number one nursing program in Florida, uh, the college and universities uh, right here at the Citrus campus, the Wilton Simpson Citrus campus. Uh, we continue to be rated the number one in the college for affordability, top 1% for affordability for our students. Uh, we, Your college also got recognized by Governor DeSantis with an innovative apprenticeship program with Lockheed Martin that is now being ported to other areas of the country with Lockheed Martin facilities and local colleges. So we continue to be a leader in workforce development and we've got more work to do this coming year. And that's why I'm here to seek some help and to partner with you because we've been able to make some great inroads over the last few years of turning out uh, the workforce talent that's needed by our business and industry. We've got three priorities that are approved by the Board of Trustees um, as well as the State Board of Education. Uh, first one up, uh, two of them are PICO projects, the public education capital outlay. The first one up is a uh, construction of a new public safety center, uh, the need for law enforcement, corrections officers, criminal justice programs. Uh, we are we passed the useful life of that building over 50 years. Uh, that's ranked third on the statewide PICO priority list and the State Department of Education's recommending full funding for the entire project in the first year because of the state of the current conditions of the facilities. It's about 33,000 square feet, will allow us to uh, expand the footprint, expand the program, get more law enforcement officers out there, as well as ex expand our training with our local law enforcement agencies that we do, do that with. Uh, second one is, it takes some on the PICO projects, it's our third priority, but our existing nursing facility that is, that's being shifted over to a new building that you uh, funded, and thank you for that. Uh, we've got to expand the EMS paramedic EMT programs, and that's going to be moving out of, again, 50-year dated facilities into uh, a renovated space that is a lower cost to the state. Uh, that's um, about $7.2 million renovation, total cost, 27,000 square feet. But again, that will allow us to expand those critically needed programs and provide a pipeline, as you've heard from Crystal River High School, Levy County, Marion County, all three areas into those facilities. Looking forward to that one. But it takes fuel. I'm a race car guy, a car buff. I'd love to, uh, it takes race car fuel to get in there, keep a car like College of Central Florida's performance running well. Um, we hope you'll support the program funding requests needed for the system in terms of our base program funding so that we can continue to invest in the faculty and the staff to support these programs. Workforce is critical right now and hard to recruit, right, as you know. Yes, sir. <laughs> In the means it just crossed the finish line. <laughs> thank, thank the Lord you were smart. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. But that actually is the end. And uh, again, thank you. We'll, we'll be touching base back with you individually on those. Uh, I just have one comment. And first of all, I want to thank you for all your work. As, as far as concentrating on workforce, make sure when you put in those project requests that you're showing how many students you have currently enrolled if you have a wait list, what your capacity would be as you increase, because that, that's important for us to see. Absolutely. And make sure that you don't do a plug-in race car. Continue <laughs> it to operate on fuel. I drive a gas vehicle, so that's just my, I'm a petrol head. Th thank you. Thank, thank you, you so both. much. Mm -hmm.
John Murphy, Citrus County Chamber of Commerce. You're recognized. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, folks, for, uh, for allowing us the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is John Murphy, and I represent the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I want to give you just a little bit of 30 seconds of backstory on our legislative priorities and, and how we kind of get there as a Chamber of Commerce. We have about 900 member businesses, and we first and foremost, we go to those member businesses, and we ask them, what is important to you? What's important to you to help your businesses grow? And legislatively, how can we help you with that? So that's the starting point for what we do. Then we take that feedback from our members, and then we go to the local municipalities. Um, we do have conversations with both the cities as well as the uh, Citrus County Board of County Commissioners. And because we feel like if we can echo some of their sentiment, we have a unified voice, that's what's better for all of us. So you'll see in our priorities, some of these are homegrown that are specifically from our members. Others are, we're just lending our support to those legislative priorities that, are, that we feel we can uh, have positive impact on the local business community. So I just wanna hit on a couple real quick for you. Uh, first and foremost, insurance reform. Thank you so much for what you guys have done thus far. We know that uh, the special session, that will pay dividends kind of moving down the road for us, but uh, we wanna see a, uh, additional reform in that area of uh, insurance reform that would be beneficial to, to consumers that, of course, will be beneficial to the local business community. So we just wanna encourage you on that. Our priorities in general tend to tend to land in the area of transportation infrastructure and water quality. You know, we only want a little bit of government in our life to begin with. And so where we want it is infrastructure, right? That's one of the core competencies or one of the things we want from our government. So in the area of infrastructure, we um, we want to make sure that you guys are uh, supportive and on a number of projects. One of them in particular that I want to draw attention to is the continued expansion of Highway 491. Uh, for, for the benefit of uh, Senator, that's an area of our county that is growing exponentially. Um, there's a lot of commercial growth as well as residential growth there. We have a, a four lane project that has been completed thus far. We are, we've, thanks to the legislator, received funding for additional four laning continuing and that's actually happening as we speak. And we just wanna see that continue. That road, the uh, four laning of it needs to continue to the intersection of a road we call Highway 200. And that would what be beneficial for us as a community is to see that that four lane through that whole thing. Um, the other is you mentioned uh, airport, Immunist Airport Industrial Park. Again, we wanna lend our voice to, to those projects that we think are important to us. Uh, the economy, local economies benefit greatly from airports. We've got two great fixed base operators in Citrus County, both in Crystal River and in Inverness. Uh, the folks in Inverness, in addition to having the uh, Antor the industrial park being adjoining to the project, they wanna see a, a hangar actually on their project on their property as well because they're wanting to partner with the local technical college to actually bring airframe power plant mechanic school right here to Inverness to actually train those folks right here in Inverness and to be able to give them jobs in this part of Florida. And so having that hangar space would be an integral part of that. The other uh, area of concern for us always is water quality. Without access to quality drinking and recreation water, we would be, uh, we would be at a, a community in decline for sure. Uh, there's a number of projects, I'll note all of them are citizen initiative, right? Uh, Crystal River Kings Bay, Homosassa, those projects are all been citizen initiative. They've uh, garnered great success and we just wanna lend our kind of support to those. And then the area communications, we happen to be a county that is not blessed with high-speed internet access or even great cell phone coverage for that matter. And so uh, DEO has, has projects and opportunities. And so we just ask that you look favorably upon that state funding for DEO projects so that communities like Citrus County can kind of benefit from that. And the final is I'll ask you is, is as all counties are struggling with affordable housing, we're not unique in that regard. However, we do have an amazing Habitat for Humanity here in Citrus County. It's run very well. It's a, it's a great pathway to home ownership. And um, if there was some, some changes in some of the ship legislation and the, some of the documentations in here, uh, that would help to kind of get those people that are on the bubble of being qualifying for, for habitat uh, funding would help them. And that in turn would be just a, a little bit wider net that could be cast for, for that pathway to home ownership. So that's all my comments. Any thoughts or questions? Thank you. Thank no, thank you, you so guys much. so much. Appreciate it. Uh, next, Rodney McRae, Homosassa River Restoration Project. Mr. McRae, you're recognized. Uh, 
Okay, my name is Rodney McCray, and I'm uh, Vice President of the Homosassa River Restoration Project. And I met you, kind sir, last year, and I uh, hope to see you again in March. I uh, want to welcome you guys to Citrus County, and thank you very much for being here. <clears throat> and my condolences go out to you, Doc, for your family. Sorry to hear that. I was unaware. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I don't have a pen to give you or anything, but I was going to try to bribe you. I brought a couple of Cuban cigars in, but they confiscated them at the gate. So if you can talk the guards out of them uh, when you go out, maybe you can get them. But I think I saw them headed to the smoking area as soon as I left. Um, <laughs> already? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> uh, okay, start over again. Uh, you should have our documents uh, with our data. I think it was mailed to your offices for the Homosassa River Restoration Project. Just to give you a little background on us, uh, we've been at this project for two and a half years now, and uh, we've spent $9.4 million, thanks to you guys. And phase one is complete, and we're thrilled about that. We are in hopes of completing phase two this year, at an estimated cost of $5.5 million. Sadly, we don't have the full funding of that phase yet, but we're hoping to get it. Um, we have a start, so we do plan on starting right after manatee season, and we'll go as long as we can. Um, we could not have gotten this far without your help, and uh, which is greatly appreciated. And uh, we cannot finish this project without your continued support. So that's what we're here for, asking for your continued support. The results are proven, and without a doubt, they are outstanding. Uh, it's not that we're asking for something in hopes that it'll work, but it has worked. The Save the Crystal River is where we got the idea from, and their project is going wonderfully well as well. And it's just a proven project and uh, doing a great job. Uh, to borrow an old phrase, the proof of the pudding is in the eating and it's there. Uh, so my question to you guys is, because everybody else that has come up here before me, and I'm sure everybody behind me, is gonna, they're asking for something as well as me. But I'm gonna ask you this, what can we do to help you make it happen for us? You had me in cigars. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I can get through the state capitol in March, you'll have them. Oh, and Mr. and Mrs. Watkins told me to tell you hello, and they give you their regard. Rodney, I just want to—I would just want to thank you for all your hard work and and the volunteer work that you and several people have put in to that project. And I will tell you, there's several, as you know, but just so everyone knows, there's several sources of money, and the money that you got this year came from our Springs Restoration money that the legislature funded. Uh, Secretary, the, uh, the Secretary of DEP wants to try to have that money be recurring to you all. A lot is going to have to do with how that project actually unfolds and the benefits of it. What you all can do is continue what you're doing, I think, as far as communicating with people using the river to take care, particularly when they anchor. Because what the state does not like to see is something that the people from Crystal River mentioned, is you go in there after we spend millions and millions of dollars and you just basically plow up all that seagrass with anchoring. So, you know, communication is very important and making sure that the people that we have coming down to see your beautiful river understand that there's responsibilities that go with those rights. Yeah, there's an education element to this process, too, that people just need to be educated about it and be more mindful in their anchoring and what they use to anchor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Michael uh, Wurrich from Too Far. So, Wurrich, you're recognized. Did I pronounce your name right? Wurrich? Wurrich. Wurrich. Close enough. And, and why don't you just tell everybody what too far means besides, it sounds like you're way out there. <laughs> well, 
Well, as you mentioned, my name's Michael Weirich. I'm from the Too Far Water and Natural Resource Foundation. Uh, we were instrumental a few years back in stopping a pipeline that uh, was coming from Tampa up to our area. They wanted to steal our water and also instrumental in a, a dam there that uh, is in the Withlacoochee River in front of the uh, uh, Lake Panasofsky. So, uh, Senator Ingolia and Representative Missoula, I appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. Um, also, Representative Missoula, thank you for the previous funding on a huge project that is in permitting as we speak. Uh, for this session, Too Far proposes to remove floating tussocks from a portion of Todd Lake, which is in the northernmost area of the Hernando Pool of the Tesala Apopka chain of lakes. This is an 80 acre tract that was uh, at one time known as the promised land by area guides and local fishermen. This area has become inundated with uh, floating tussocks, which is masses of vegetation, which make navigation through there virtually impossible by anything except airboats. The, uh, the cost to remove those floating masses of vegetation and restore this back to its uh, original is $1,040,000. Secondly, Too Far proposes to remove floating tussocks and vegetation from an area in the Tesala Apopka Lake, which is in the Inverness Pool. Uh, it is just south of Gospel Island Road between the outflow canal and the bed and breakfast, approximately 30 acres. This area has become so grown up with the vegetation that even an airboat cannot get through there. Uh, the cost for that is 390,000. Total cost for this session is $1,430,000. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have uh, Jack Schofield with Lacucci Aquatic Restoration. You're recognized, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Senator Angolia and Representative Mazzullo. Uh, my name is Jack Schofield. I'm the current president of Wolf Lacucci Aquatic Restoration. Uh, Dan Hilliard, who has spoken many times in front of the Citrus County, uh, is still on our board, but uh, need a little bit of a break. So I'm here today to give you an update, which some of you may have some information on that, what we e emailed to you earlier. The attention to a situation that has existed for just over 60 years when the Cross Florida Barge Canal was created. Since this time, degradation of the Lower Withlacoochee and Lake Rousseau's water quality has occur occurred and continues to go down. Withlacoochee Aquatic Restoration in 2016 hired Wetlands Solutions to do a study of the waters, comparing new data with previously collected data by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Swift Mud, and FWC. Approximately 340,000 was invested by members of War, Duke Energy, Drummond Bank, Falburn Foundation, the towns of English and Yankeetown, state agencies who provided in-kind assistance in this study included FDEP, FWC, and Swift Mud. The study was done in three stages and was completed in 2020. Copies of the study were sent by email to your offices. Uh, hopefully you've got them. If you haven't, I'll make sure you get them again. Uh, they were also sent to uh, Senator Perry and Representative Clements as this water body covers multiple uh, jurisdictions or districts. Uh, the phase one summary, and I'm just gonna be brief, was in studying existing data that was out there from Swift Mud, DEP, FWC. Phase two was an updated baseline of environmental con uh, conditions, and phase three was the assessment uh, of environmental impacts, uh, impairments, and restoration recommendations, which some of those are in the executive uh, summary there that I handed out to you. 
Key findings were low flows in the lower river was creating buildup of sediment in the river, higher levels of nitrates and nitrogens from the outflow of the Rainbow River affected the impounded section of the river, uh, which is Lake Rousseau, creating aggressive growth of aquatic plants. Uh, spraying of aquatic plants also affected the lower river as loss of aquatic vegetation has, has occurred in the lower river uh, the, with Lacucci, which is basically below the, the English spillway going down uh, between uh, English Yankeetown and Citrus County. Uh, pharmaceuticals were found in the water, including acetamethine and blood pressure medicines. Uh, and that actually has been found in other areas and studies done by uh, in the state, uh, especially in the Keys, where they found uh, these chemicals in bonefish. War has also received resolutions of support for the restoration of the lower and the impounded riverine section of the lower with Lacoochee from the Sisters County and Levy County Board of County Commissioners, as well as the towns of English and Yankeetown. I have copies of which I gave you the executive summary and tried to read as fast as I could. <laughs> the ask down the road is going to is somewhere to get help through federal government, which created this thing of anywhere between 2020 numbers of 140 million to 300 million to resolve all of these issues, which includes uh, septic to sewer, relocation or re rerouting of the waters, cleaning of the lakes and the rivers. And uh, may I just add one thing that the Blue Green Algae Task Force uh, really identified a lot of these situations that are happening through our state. But I appreciate the time and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And make sure that you, uh, if you need any help applying for those federal grants, you certainly can let us know. Uh, it, I was at the Marion County delegation meeting uh, the other day, and uh, uh, there wasn't anyone from your area that actually spoke for some reason. I'm not sure why. But anyway, um, we want you to know that that delegation also is interested in, in continuing that, that cleanup. Okay. Sorry, I missed that one. But we will be at the Levy County, so we'll be. All right, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. John Labriola, Florida Citizens Alliance, you're recognized. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Representative Masulo and Senator Angolia. My name is John Labriola. I'm here today representing, uh, as the official Citrus County representative for, for Florida Citizens, Citizens Alliance, um, also known as the FCLA. Uh, we are the um, we are dedicated to um, a statewide organization dedicated to championing school reforms to protect children from harmful indoctrination agendas and to defend parental rights in Florida. Uh, you should have some material uh, briefing materials that I provided um, Representative Masulo's um, aide Adele. Uh, if not, I do have extra copies for you um, or you can contact me after the meeting. Um, but uh, those briefing materials uh, represented our 2023 K through 12 nine-point legislative agenda. In the interest of time, however, I will address items one, um, universal education and savings account, and items two and four related to harmful for minors and our request for an, associ an associated parental right opt-in amendment. Uh, we're excited to hear that Speaker Renner and the Governor uh, DeSantis will actively pursue a universal, universal ESA uh, education savings account. FLCA will very actively support this, but would strongly like to see it include four specific concepts. Number one, to include and be acceptable to Florida homeschool families. Number two, significantly, significantly expand the student uh, funding organizations, F, uh, SFOs, to include many, many charities. Arizona actually has more than 50. Today, Florida only has a step up for students and AAA foundation. They have become slow and bureaucratic. Competition is always a great thing. More importantly, donors should have a wide range of, of choices. Uh, allow, number three is to allow individual property owners to allocate a portion of their property tax assessment to the SFO of their choice. Uh, number, let's see, to the SFO of their choice. Uh, number four is to establish the savings account for each student awarded an FSA, uh, sorry, an ESA. The Gardner Scholarship is a great model to follow. Moving to item two, harmful to minors, and item four, opt-in, FLCA has successfully led a statewide movement demanding the removal of sexually explicit materials with our 2019 and more recent 2021 porn report for all 67 counties. It's past time for the legislature to step up and stop allowing school districts to abuse school children with this filth. To quote Sheriff Grady, uh, Grady Judd, 
many of these obscene materials are sexually grooming young children to be sex trafficked. It is up to the school, it is up to the legislature to repeal the several loopholes in FS 847.001 and 847.012 that, uh, uh, that the school districts exploit. Hand in hand with this repeal effort is adding a true opt-in to the parents' rights law, which uh, we thank both of you for your leadership in passing that law last year and, and um, having the uh, governor sign it. Today, parents are required to opt in for their child to play sports or even get a, an aspirin from the school nurse, but their children can be sexually exploited daily without parental knowledge. Thank you for listening and hopefully uh, becoming a champion to rescue our children or continuing to be champions for rescuing the children. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Gabriel. Uh, Richard Romeo, uh, Senior versus Crime. You're recognized. And company. Good afternoon. My name is Dick Romeo, and I'm here with John Eisner and Ron McMahon. And together, we've been, and with others, we've been working with Senator Baxley's office and his staff to try to plug a hole in our criminal justice system. It's a hole that's been out there for several years. It's allowed scammers and encouraged scammers to steal thousands of dollars every day from Florida residents, especially our seniors. Let me show you how the scam works. If I'm an unlicensed uh, vendor, I knock on your door, I give you my card, talk to you about a service, and at the end, if you agree, I ask you for a deposit. Might be $500, might be $2,000, depending on how much I can squeeze from you. And when I leave, I have absolutely no intent of ever coming back again. And after several weeks, when I don't show up and I don't answer your phone calls, maybe you have the courage to go down to the sheriff's office. And the sheriff, unfortunately, tells you to your surprise, this is not a criminal matter. This is a civil matter. And in, in fact, when I had one deputy who said, you know, when you deal with this guy, you got to be careful because he's been doing this to people for years. And maybe finally you go to seniors versus crime. And unfortunately, they confirm the same thing. This is a civil matter, not a criminal matter. But they can look me up in their database. And maybe I have 10, 15, 20 other cases where I've stolen money from other people. But they can't do anything because I refuse to deal with them. When I worked for seniors versus crime for several years, I worked with seniors who've been scammed this way. And I'll tell you, it's rough sledding. But I wanted to know how bad this situation was. So we wrote to Steve Renico. Steve is a retired Michigan chief of police and now the district region four district manager for seniors versus crime. And he's responsible for 15 counties in central and north central Florida, including Citrus. And I asked him several questions. Question number one, how common is this activity? Answer, very common. He gave us over 20 examples of different scams that they run into. And it might be uh, bad actors who have one or two pro uh, cases they might have 15, 20, 30 cases, but there's nothing they can do. The money involved might be $500 all the way up to $40,000 for a case. Question, is there anything law enforcement can do? Answer, no, because it's a civil matter, not a criminal matter. Question, are there any uh, cr criminal statutes that will cover and help? Answer, no. And here I add my own comment. Um, Steve is the regional director for seniors versus crime. That's a special project to the attorney general's office. If there is a statute out there, I respectfully submit the attorney general's office would know about it. Question, what happens to these cases? Answer, they're administratively dismissed, which means they're put in a file and nothing happens. Question, is there anything the legislature can do? Answer, absolutely. For the first time, they can plug this hole. We've also provided you a copy with Steve's letter. Um, and we have also given you a copy of our proposed statute and an explanatory document that explains all the parts. Just have a couple comments about it. First of all, this last draft was put together with a lot of input from our community, including seniors versus crime, the Florida Chamber of Commerce up in Tallahassee, some comments from various state attorneys. I would say first and foremost, this is not an anti-unlicensed vendor statute. In a, in a community like ours, we need these folks. They're hardworking people. They deserve our thanks for the work they do. This is an anti-scammer statu uh, statute that we're proposing. Second of all, for the first time, it labels this conduct as what it should be, which is criminal. 
And finally, there's something unique about that statute. We have a free get out of jail car. And what the, by that, what I mean is, if a, if a vendor wants to avoid any criminal liability, the vendor only has to do one thing, give the money back. But they can't keep the money and not do the work and not expect to have some criminal consequences from that action. And we've been told by seniors versus crime and, and various law enforcement people that this provision alone can probably resolve a lot, if not most of these cases. In summary, what we'd like to do finally is plug the hole. Finally, label this conduct what it is, which is criminal. And finally, shut down the scam. But to do that, we need your support. Do you have any other comments? Okay. No, Yeah, because I'm also going to ask some questions. It's only ten dollars a minute. Thank you. <laughs> I, I can handle that. <clears throat> um, nice to meet you both. Um, in case you didn't know, we're from Sumter County, um, but we are. Okay, so now, nonetheless, welcome. That we was actually we had them until then, John. No, that was, <laughs> no, that was actually one of my questions because yes. you had forwarded me information. I read it. See, yes. I do check my okay. emails. Okay, we we we've been trying to contact your staff. We didn't know if you got our material. No, your, I got it. Your staff invited us to come down to this forum, so that's why we're here. Okay, I do have it, and so I have read some of the stuff that you have sent it to me. So proof that I do read my emails, and. A while ago, a couple of years ago, weren't you guys also involved in some unlicensed activity? It's the same, activity? It's the same statute. You were, right. You were involved in that from the House perspective. Correct. Okay. I just want to make sure it's the same no, group of people. It's the same group of people. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Ron um, McMahon, who was with us, because he's shepherded this through the Republican County Executive um, in uh, Sumter County and kept it in the... Uh, Republican view. Um, I've been doing other things. Uh, when we started, we thought we should contact as many people as possible. So we've been in touch with the Democratic executive. We've been in touch with the Property Owners Association, uh, League of Women Voters. All of these people have read all our materials and they have supported them. We think that other groups like them in other counties would probably support this same concept as well because they all know about these instances. They've all got a neighbor someplace that got scammed. Um, more recently, uh, we've reached out um, to other folks, um, and Dick mentioned the chamber. Um, we've asked for Renico to give you more information. His boss, um, who is uh, Don Ravenna, has been involved this past year, um, and we've had uh, very interest from Senator Baxley for the, all four years. Um, so we are trying to expand our um, horizons, and that's why we are here continuing to look for um, more legislative support than just what Baxley was able to give us and uh, Representative Haig in the past. So we're just trying to expand that. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Chair. The issue that you're running into is a question of intent, right? So that's the sheriff's office is saying is that what they cannot adjudicate at that point if somebody intended to defraud or if they were just horrible business people and they wound up away, running away with the money, right? So that's what the... That, the that, that comes from uh, a, a case in the uh, state Supreme grab Court. Grab the microphone so everyone can hear. This comes from a case, I think it's called Stragmolia versus the state, in which the court said... An it, Italian contractor, who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, be careful. <laughs> oh, I, did you see these tapes? <laughs> <No. laughs> And what the court said in circumstances like this, you've got to show an intent to defraud right. at the time they take the money. Correct. And that's what I'm getting and, at. And, and that's one of the problems we have with all the fraud statutes that are out there because they have to follow that rule. But your assertion, your assertion, if I'm not wrong, is that multiple from the same contractor is sort of proving the intent. Well, I'm well, not exactly. What I'm saying is the, the statute as we've presented it, really we borrowed from the theft by abandonment statute that the legislature passed a couple of years ago at the uh, suggestion of the chamber. What we're saying is we're redefining how to define criminal intent. And if the vendor doesn't do A, B, C, D, and E under the statute, that's enough for criminal intent. 
we don't have to go back to the case law. So that's how we're getting around criminal intent. That's why you need the statute for unlicensed vendors. It's in there for, for theft by abandonment for licensed contractors, but there's nothing in there for unlicensed vendors. Okay, so my question, if there's anyone in, uh, and this is for my staff also, is anybody law enforcement, if they can answer the question, not now, but just later, I want to know if these economic crimes come forward in the community, do the sheriff's department or the police, if it's city, actually have a record of this? Are they actually taking a physical record of this? Or are they not taking a record um, because they say automatically they show up and say, hey, this is a civil matter? Because then the actual record will make or break what you're trying to do because you actually need a physical hard copy record of it. Right. Well, my understanding, and I certainly don't work for law enforcement, is that th these folks are referred over to Seniors versus Crime. Seniors versus Crime does have a record. And if you see in Steve's uh, letter to us, there are some vendors that have over a hundred different complaints doing the same thing. But Seniors versus Crime does have a record. I'm not sure that law enforcement does because most of those cases are referred over to Seniors versus Crime. And I think that's, it's important for us to find out because if we're gonna start going after these bad actors, it would probably be better for the courts if we had a sworn law enforcement officer taking that testimony and having an actual public record of it. Okay. Just my thought. No, no. I, and if we see you on Thursday, we'll have Steve and he can answer you directly. So you're following me to Sumter? I am. All right. <laughs> it's closer to home. And I really appreciate your taking the time. You know, um, this, is a, this is something we embarked on several years ago. We are bound and determined to plug this hole because it goes on. I can tell you in the years I worked with Seniors versus Crime, it happened every day. I'm sure you know, but one thing we have done that I think is somewhat tangential but will yield results in the future is we eliminated assignment of benefits that uh, a lot of these people that come knock on people's doors and get them to sign off their insurance benefits and uh, particularly for Especially seniors. for the roofers. Well, it could be any any contractor, right. licensed or unlicensed, that uh, now that, that responsibility was gonna fall on the homeowners. Right. And uh, they'll be the intermediary between the insurance company and them getting the money from the contract. And thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next. For the record, I am an Italian contractor. I know you are. <laughs> oh, I know you are. <laughs> but he's a full blooded American citizen. That's why we um. let you mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Theodore Williams and Kimberly Kelly, Danell and Moose Family Center. You're recognized. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. You're recognized. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Representative Masulo and Senator Angolia for letting us come today. Uh, my name is Kimberly Kelly. I'm both the historian and the communications chairman for Donnell and Moose Family Center Lodge 2308. Uh, the Donnell and Moose was established almost 36 years ago on April 12, 1987, just to give you a little history. A year later, we acquired a, a piece of property with a building that was built in 1972, so it's 50 years old now, um, and it is located up in Donnellan on the Citrus County side of Donnellan. On September 13th of last year, state health inspectors came to the lodge with a presentation of what needs to be done to remain current with uh, the current laws um, for health codes. And their, their comment was very simple. You must connect to the county sewer system, period. Um, there were no other options that they gave us. Um, it, if it's not completed soon, uh, and we have started the process, um, they will ultimately close the lodge down. And there's a whole lot of things that's going to happen when that, uh, if that occurs. Um, first of all, um, I gave you a diagram so you can see, kind of see where we're at. We're located right on Highway 41. Um, the things that's going to happen when, if 
the time comes and we are not operational, um, is donations to a lot of local community, uh, local organizations like Special Olympic Citrus, the Florida Sheriff's Youth Ranch, high school sports, college scholarships, Find Them Friends, the local homeless, uh, veterans in crisis, children in need, school supplies, victims for domestic uh, violence, local law enforcement. We have our own program called, um, it's a moose initiative, Safe Surfing, which deals with educating children on the safe practices of using the internet, a child ID program that uh, gives families vital information about their children so that if um, they do go missing, they have information to give to law enforcement to help them find them. Um, it also reaches across the state. We have uh, Moose Haven, a, a residential retirement community over in Orange Park. Um, and we have a, a handful of people from our lodge that are down in uh, Fort Myers area, uh, Cape, Cape Coral and Pine Island, um, who've been down there ever since Hurricane Ian hit, um, helping to rebuild and help restore um, individuals' lives voluntarily, voluntarily um, of their time. Um, so we're at, we've asked for um, funds to connect to the, the county water system, our sewer system, um, and it includes a lift station, a grinder, and then the connection actually at the county at the at the highway. Uh, excuse me. When you said you asked for funds, do you, have you made an appropriation yes. request yes. to the city no. of Denellen? Or we are not in the city of Denellen. Okay, we're, Citrus Springs. we're in Citrus Springs. All right. So, so you're. Have you talked to the county about it? Yes, sir. We have. Okay. And so you'll apply for a appropriation request through the legislature? Is that your That's goal? our objective, Okay, sir. good. All right. I've, you have any questions? Go ahead. Yeah. It, what is this property zoned? It's commercial zoned. It is commercial zoned? Yes, sir. It is. Was it an old uh, residential? No, sir. You converted? Back in the day, uh, it used to be supposedly a bar. Uh, uh, where it was one section that was built in 72, then they added on, then they added on, but it is an old commercial property. And it's currently, it's an old gravity fed sep uh, septic system? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, so the question I have is that on the northwest side of the property, it looks like it's a budding commercial. Is that accurate? Yes, sir, it is. So where does the sewer end? At the, uh, the driveway apron on the commercial? It comes across our driveway out front, the septic line comes right through our driveway. So it does come across the property? Yes, sir, it does. And, but we've got to come around the back of the property to the front of the property to hook into it. And that's where we have to put the lift station and grinder. So it's in the... I'm our septic tank. Our pipes lead out in the back, obviously, to the septic. We have to take it, cut it from there, and then run the pipe straight up to the road to hook in, which is a state road. What is the approximate cost of that? A drop in the bucket from the figures I've heard here today, we're we're looking for about sixty thousand. Why is that so much? We have to get this uh, architectural engineer uh, is working on it right now, and they're eating up uh, our finances on that. <laughs> it's about six to twelve thousand. Is what I've been told is going to be the bill on that one. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, Maxine Connor, Florida Springs Council. Ms. Connor, you recognized? Thank you. Hello, I'm Maxine Connor, resident of Homosassa, speaking you, to you today on behalf of Florida Springs Council, the only statewide advocacy organization solely focused on Florida Springs and Springfield Rivers. Thank you again for bringing funding to Citrus County to continue local river cleanup and septic to sewer conversions. We ask for your continued support. But these efforts won't solve the whole long-term problem unless the legislature adopts the greater goal to stop the root causes of pollution of our springs and waterways. Please focus on ways to reduce excessive nutrient pollution from agriculture, turf fertilizer, septic systems, and support effective springs restoration projects. 
Florida has more than a thousand springs and they are suffering from reduced flow and excess nutrient pollution. Pollutants from agriculture, wastewater, and urban fertilizer that are not taken up at the surface enter the aquifer and come out at the spring vents. Agriculture is the major pollution source in rural areas while pollution from septic tanks and urban fertilizer is more prevalent in urban and suburban areas. Increased water withdrawals for development in agriculture reduce the quantity of water in the Florida aquifer, reducing spring flows. This imbalance negatively impacts springs biologic communities leading to the formation of sinkholes and springs drying up in severe cases. Nitrogen levels in many of the springs are five to 10 times higher than state water quality limits. Nitrogen feeds the toxic algae that kills native plants, causing manatees to starve, destroying habitat, and reducing recreational opportunities. If the basin management action plans, which are created to restore impaired springs and rivers, and the agricultural best management practices were enough, we wouldn't have this problem. Basin management action plans do not contain enough projects over a 20-year period to restore polluted waterways. And they don't account for increased nitrogen pollution that will come from future increased growth and development. Also, best management practices need to be verified and enforced to reduce pollution. Please go to the Florida Springs Council website to read a better BMAP for detail on suggested le legislative changes. Their study and report shows that springs restoration, though difficult, is achievable. Suggested legislative changes include best management practices, verification and enforcement, fertilizer taxes and water usage fees, and proceeds from these could and should be used for land purchases or cost share in initiatives to reduce pollution, and, land and using land acquisition trust funds to purchase the most polluting agricultural properties. So thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Thank you very much, Ms. Connor. We appreciate it. Uh, both uh, Senator Ngolea and myself are very environmentally conscious. As a matter of fact, we both in different times have chaired State Affairs, which is the committee that's actually in charge of environment and agriculture in our state. And uh, a lot of the initiatives that you've put forward, we are working on. Uh, people always bring up that uh, we're never adequate. I, the problem is quite complex and extremely large but the state does prioritize it. And Florida is one of the few states in the country, particularly Florida, that's made a big investment in water and water quality. And I think in the last several years, we've spent over $3 billion in water restoration in our springs. This area particularly is a priority for us. Thank you so much. And we've inherited the degradation from the past. So thank yes. you. Thank you. Next up, we have... Um, Gene McGee, Life Stream Behavior Center. Gentlemen, you thank you. Thank you not only for being here today, uh, but for the advocacy over the next four months that you're going to do uh, after listening to all the community's wants and needs. We appreciate the work that you're going to do, not just the work that you're doing here today. Uh, I am here for Life Stream Behavioral Health, who is the contracted uh, mental health and substance abuse provider for Citrus County. Um, for the last three years, we've been funded for $1.5 million to help in Baker Act and Marchman Act. Uh, of the individuals from Citrus County here. Uh, we're gonna request that you file special member projects again this year for those uh, for that money. We do have an initiative in the Senate. Senate President Pasadomo has seen really kind of the lunacy of trying to fund this on a non-recurring basis. Uh, there are ongoing uh, critical services for our community, uh, buildings, personnel, processes that are funded and non-recurring every year. Uh, so I believe that she's going to put a package together of all the central receiving facilities in the state, take the total of those funds, and have it go through recurring. The House isn't really able to do that because special member projects have to be non-recurring. So the hope is going to be that the Senate passes what you will, we will ask you to file as a request, Senator Ngoglia, as a backup, but hopefully the Senate will send a package over of recurring funding to the House, which they will adopt, so we won't have to go through this every year with the $1.5 million non-recurring appropriation request. But this year, we would ask you to file that request um, and to pursue it as a special member project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Rosemary Niles, League of Women's Voters of Citrus County. Ms. Niles, you're recognized. 
Good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Nillis, uh, League of Women Voters of Citrus County. Senator, Senator Angolia, congratulations on your election. Welcome to Citrus County. A representative Masulo, the League extends our deepest sympathies on the loss of your father. Thank you. League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working for over 100 years to protect and expand voting rights to ensure every citizen is represented in our democracy. We work closely with uh, Ms. Baird and her wonderful staff in Citrus County. Today, we ask your consideration on three election-related topics in Florida, voter registration, vote by mail, and school board elections. First, voter registration. In 2022, Florida's legislature dramatically raised fines and penalties for third-party voter registration groups like the League. But civic groups like ours are essential for assisting Floridians to register successfully on their own, who are more or who are more likely to register only after personal encouragement from a community member. Florida legislators have made many changes to election laws over the last few years. Nonpartisan voter registration drives are especially helpful for those who have the hardest time navigating the new election regulations. While registration drives are especially needed in some communities, they actually benefit everyone. They help ensure that more citizens can exercise their right and responsibility to vote. Please oppose any further efforts to restrict voter registration efforts. We ask that respectfully. Second, vote by mail. Now that we're past the 2022 elections, all voters who had a vote by mail request on file must now request a new one. Voters will need to do this every two years. We respectfully ask that funds be allocated to the Division of Elections and local official elections officials so that they may use every means at their disposal to educate the voters about these changes. Third, school board elections. I'm referring to HJR 31, Partisan Elections for School Boards. This bill would place a constitutional amendment on the ballot to change school board elections from nonpartisan to partisan. Floridians already approved a constitutional amendment to make school board elections nonpartisan. That was in 1998. 64% of voters approved that amendment. There's no sound reason to change this practice and to bring more partisan politics into our already beleaguered schools. And non-party voters wouldn't be able to vote for school board in the primaries. School board members should be elected on their ideas, not their parties. They should make decisions based on facts and data, not, not partisan politics. We respectfully ask that you oppose this bill. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Mr. John Woods, and he's representing the Citrus Springs Civics Association. And Mr. Woods, I would tell you that both the senator and I have had rocks thrown at us before, but we've never had one delivered, but uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Yours for the keeping. Hey, good afternoon, uh, Representative Mazzullo and uh, Senator Ngogwe. I'm the president of the Citrus Springs Civic Association, and after querying uh, many members of our association, the main uh, impetus of the main thing they want done is our roads. I gave you the photos that was taken this morning. That seems to be a representative sample of what our roads are like. To quote our uh, commissioner in our area here, one of her campaign promises, I hope it wasn't just rhetoric that it's going to be an actual come to fruition, is pave our roads. Our county must make a commitment to invest in our infrastructure. We can no longer ignore the state of our roadways. And uh, two other tenured commissioners, a conservative voter record to be proud of, we've made significant investment in infrastructure improvements where needed. And another one, which is how we keep taxes in check and still afford those better roads and other amenities. Our roads are in horrible condition. And I believe that the uh, worst to first with density, uh, I think that might be a scheme to not pave our roads up there. We're uh, 32,000 buildable lots of which there's six to 7,000 houses. And as the Architectural Revo Review Committee Chairman, uh, we are approving hundreds of houses every month and there's more on track to be approved. So I would like to see an appropriation and I'll present the same to the County Commission to pave our roads only specifically intended for Citrus Springs, not mice type or other or and other or for a county in general, but for Citrus Springs. And I invite you any day, I'll do a ride along with you and show you the roads up there. 
Sometimes you're going to need a Humvee or a Jeep. Now, taking off my president's hat and putting on another hat, I would urge you to support uh, State Representative Joel Rudman's upcoming legislation to allow non-charter counties, which we are, to have recall. I think it's a matter of our First Amendment rights to petition the government, and by not allowing non-charter counties, such as we are, not to petition our government to recall local officials would be a violation of our First Amendment rights. I'd urge you to support that legislation. Now, do you have any questions for me or anything? No. Is okay, thank you very much. Thank you. You want uh, to rock that? No, you can keep it. Lisa Moore, Kings Bay Restoration. Ms. Moore, are you here? Yes, you are. Very good. You're recognized. Did you bring us any algae? <laughs> you can't find it anymore, can you? Can't find it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for coming today and, and allowing us to bring forward our request for legislative funding. Um, the Save Crystal River um, organization has been engaged in the uh, restoration of Kings Bay for the last eight years. Um, we're requesting this year an uh, additional $4 million in funding to continue the restoration uh, down the rest of the river. Um, so we have uh, over 80 acres in Kings Bay uh, that we have restored so far. Um, we, were on, we are on track to finish the whole 92 first uh, four phases um, by July 3rd of 2023, which is the centennial anniversary of the city of Crystal River. Um, this funding will be used to expand where we have already worked and work in Hunter Springs Basin, which is the only beach access for the public in Crystal River. Um, the uh, Cedar Cove, which is where the City Walk is now involved, evolved in getting built. Crystal Shores Canals, Miller's Creek, which has a huge plugged up spring that needs to be opened, and the canals in the Indian Water Subdivision. Um, I brought this little shovel today to show you that this is where we started. In 2015, this was one of the students' shovels that started the project when we opened it all up. Adults were there, the legislature was there, DEP was there, and the kids were there, and they've been with us ever since. Some of the first students that were involved in the project are now in the 11th grade, and they probably know more about restoration than most kids in the state, because they've been taught all the way through. Um, so Save Chris River is an all-volunteer, 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, and like I said, we've been working eight years on this project, and we're going to continue until we finish, with your help. Um, I think both of you probably know that, that um, the crystal clear waters of Kings Bay were taken over by an invasive algae, blue-green algae, called Lingbia. Um, it destroyed the ecosystem. There was not enough oxygen in the water. We lost our fish, our crabs, our water quality, and our water clarity. When we started this project, we va started vacuuming out the Lingbia and the decayed material on the bottom of the river. And replaced it with native seagrass, and then we covered it with, with, invasive, uh, with cages to protect it so that it wouldn't get eaten until it got ready to spread. And um, we have maintained it um, all these eight years. Whoops. Um, so we've opened a total of 850 spring vents. Um, we've, we're gonna be restoring the 92 acres will be complete by that centennial date. Uh, we've taken out over 400 million pounds of lingbia, that rotted material on the bottom, 400 million pounds. And we've planted over 420,000 eelgrass plants. And the grass has spread now to almost 300 acres. Other benefits of this project, this organization is all volunteer, and we have worked really hard not only to um, make that part of the project complete, but we're trying to make it sustainable. So. Um, the 116,000 pounds of floating eelgrass happened this year because of natural shed of the grass and also due to boating activity um, in the area. We've got, we got a, um, a, a, a harvesting type machine 
Um, it's called a skimmer, and it's taken up 116 pounds of that floating grass, and we took 15,000 pounds of it to Homosassa Springs Attraction um, to feed to the critical care unit manatees down there. So it's not only benefiting the river, but it's also benefiting those manatees that are um, struggling down Ms. there Moore, in the can center. You, can you wrap up? Yes, yes. Um, you spoke about responsible anchoring. We started a responsible anchoring program, an Eco Week, Book Line and Thinkers program. All these are educational programs. We reach out to the public, and the economy and the fishing and crabbing industries are back. So we would like your help in helping us finish this project. We started it. We're It's going great. I mean, you've seen it. And, and I hope you've seen it. And if you don't, if you haven't seen it yet, come on over. We'll take you out. But um, it's, a, it's a valuable project, and it's been successful, and we would like your help in seeing it continue. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Ms. Moore. Next Thank up, you. Barbara Wheeler and Cheryl Lambert, Mid-Florida Homeless Coalition. You ladies are recognized. She's not going too far away from me. Trust That's me. fine. <laughs> you recognize Ms. Wheeler. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you today. I am Barbara Wheeler, the Executive Director of Mid Florida Homeless Coalition, and I bring with me today Cheryl Lambert, who is our housing navigator and the immediate past president of the Florida Realtors. So, Mid Florida Homeless Coalition is the lead agency for Citrus, Hernando, Lake, and Sumter counties. So, we get to do four delegation meetings. <laughs> we are here today to share with you ours and the Florida Coalition of, to End Homelessness, our legislative priorities. So our first priority, our first request is to support DCF's legislative budget request to increase homeless continu continuum of care staffing grant. The COCs continue to incur additional costs to complete the required task as outlined in Statute 420.644. The state's support of the homeless staffing grant is critical to our Florida COC system, which draws down and administers over $90 million of, annually to the state from HUD. Staffing funds are especially helpful to smaller COCs like ours. Mm -hmm. As you are aware, the cost of everything is rising. You heard people talking today about retention and recruiting. We just lost a staff member today because we don't, we aren't able to pay enough. So including salaries, office, rent, equipment, electricity, internet, everything has gone up. These funds do literally provide a roof over our head. To, they have allowed us to keep our COC operating, which has brought funds into the communities if these funds um, aren't able to be increased, we need at least to be able to maintain them because without that, we don't have the ability to be able to bring in to our community the funds that we are using to house people on a daily basis. Another part of our request is to support DCF's LBR to reinstate funding for the recurring base budget homeless housing assistance grant. This grant was around some 16 years ago when I first took this position. It went away during the recession and it hasn't come back. Part of the reason we're asking for these funds at this time is things have never been as bad as we're seeing right now. In my 16 years, things just have gotten really out of hand when we see senior citizens coming to our door that have lost housing. And part of what we're looking at is using the challenge grant, which Cheryl's going to talk about in a minute, for keeping people in housing and using these dollars to move them from homelessness to housing. Uh, we'll give you another minute. Go ahead, Ms. Ms. Lambert. Ms. Lambert. Oh, Ms. Lambert. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Our second request is to support DCF's LBR to increase reoccurring homeless challenge grant funding to $15,657. Homeless challenge grants have been funded by the legislator each year since 2014. Pursuant to Florida State Statute 420-644, 
Funding provided for challenge grants can be used to support the program activity or service outlined in the COC plan to reduce homelessness. Please support this. Thank you. The challenge grant has provided our COC with funding to move people from literally homelessness to housing. Our COC goal is that 80% <clears throat> remained housed after a year of ending services, and we have exceeded that goal here in Citrus, or in all of our counties, I'm sorry, that we cover. <laughs> and now I ask for the Sadowski Housing Trust Fund. You're out of time. <laughs> okay, I'm out of time. All right. <laughs> But uh, we that's know right. that we know that's a priority. Was, that's always say, a priority. I see you, I'll see you up in Tallahassee in a few weeks. All right. Very good. <laughs> okay. Thank you both. All right. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate it. Monty Floyd, Moms for Liberty. You're recognized. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, congratulations to both of you on your recent election victories. Um, my name is Monty Floyd. I'm both the acting vice chair of the Hernando County chapter of Moms for Liberty, as well as the appointed legislative rep for the counties of Hernando, Citrus, and Sumter. As the appointed rep, I have the honor of serving as a member of the Florida Legislative Committee for Moms for Liberty, which is presently hard at work on establishing our official legislative agenda for the 2023 session. I presently stand before the Citrus County delegation today for three reasons. First, to introduce myself and let you know that we are here to support our local delegates 100%. Uh, second, to ask if you are planning to propose any legislation that bears relevance to our mission, we would love the opportunity to review it, and it is our hope that we can assist with and support effective bills this session to continue to make Florida education number one in our country. For the record, the mission of Moms for Liberty includes, but is not limited to, the topics of parental rights, education, school choice, school board, the Florida Department of Education, and protecting our children from the woke agenda, just to name a few items. Third and finally, I'm here today on behalf of concerned parents of Citrus County to present the local legislative areas that our, your constituents have expressed to us as primary areas of concern. These areas include amending statute 847.012, as well as 847.001 to protect children by closing various loop woke loopholes, which still permit sexually age inappropriate materials to be presented to them in schools. Strengthen House Bill 1467 to further protect children by not only closing even more woke loopholes, but strengthening the, strengthening the language of the bill to protect all children, K through 12, and to force districts to be fully transparent regarding materials, as well as limit the terms of elected school board members. Last but not least, we support making school board elections partisan to ensure that they are fully transparent. Ironically, anyone claiming that school boards are not partisan are doing so to advance a partisan agenda. Um, you will find that I have attached a specific breakdown regarding which loopholes need to be closed and what language needs to be strengthened. If you would like more information or have questions, I'm available to answer any of them right now. And if not, you could reach me by phone or email. Um, if there's no questions, just thank like, you. like to thank you for your time. God bless both of you and, and have a good day. Thank you so much. Art Jones, one rank at a time. Art, you're recognized. Yeah, Art Jones, one rank at a time. Um, I'm so happy to see uh, Save Crystal River here in the Homosassa River Alliance and uh, the people from the lakes too far and uh, also the, the, the war, the with, with the Coochie area things. Uh, I'm representing the Rainbow River right now. Um, we're starting a project up there, just like we started the projects down here, one rake at a time. A lot of people getting in there and physically removing, uh, this time it's Hydrilla, where we battled Lingbia in Crystal River. Uh, before there was Lingbia, there was Hydrilla. Up in the Rainbow River, Hydrilla is dominating the lower Rainbow River. And as it tops out, it stops the water from flowing. And then it starts allowing Lingbia algae, that 
horrible blue-green algae to start growing. So we've been raking it out by hand. And we want to do the exact same thing that has happened here in Crystal River and now Homosassa is uh, cleaning it up and planting eel grass. Are you That's using the otters to help you? or The otters are like our mascots. <laughs> yeah, so Crystal River's got the manatees for their you know mascots, so we figured we'd grab the otters up here. And just here's another... Example, we're the same thing we did in uh, Kings Bay, uh, getting in there, hand raking it out, putting it in bins, using kayaks as floating barges to gather it all up. We've got school kids coming out. We've got the community coming out. We're, we're really putting our backs into it and doing as much hand raking and, and removal as we can now. Um, our, our plan is to start um, at the bottom, phase one of the river because that's the dirtiest. That's where the most hydrilla is, that's where the most muck is, and that's where lingvia is invading. That's where it, the, the flow is down. Um, and then go up the river. The, a lot of the river in the upper area is not too bad, but we wanna carefully survey it and see what does need to be done, hit the hot spots. And so, so our objective is, of course, to restore the 5.7 miles of the river do it in five phases. So we want to remove the muck, get the muck out, and then replant eelgrass and maintain it. The beautiful thing is that what's happened in Kings Bay and is now happening in Homosassa, they doubted us. They're like, oh, you know, when I started raking out, they go, it's never going to work. It, you know, it's going to come right back. But we've now proven that if the eelgrass is given a chance and can get its roots down to that sandy bottom once we get rid of the muck, that it will grow and it will outcompete the hydrilla, it'll outcompete the algae, and it will um, stop the need for spraying chemicals, just like we haven't been using any chemicals in Kings Bay for a long time. So we're putting in an appropriation to get a pilot project started in the Rainbow River, and I hope you'll support it. Thank you, Thank you very much. Most Thank you. Appreciate you. Next up, BJ Wallace. Mr. Wallace, are you still here? Okay. We'll go with uh, Karen Hoadley, Citrus Hills Country Club. Yes, Citrus okay. Hills, uh, Cambridge Green, Cambridge Septic Green? to Sewer. Septic to Sewer. To Sewer Project, yes. Um, I'm the chair of the septic to sewer project that we have coming up. Um, we um, do a couple of things. We help our seniors and retirees. We're 86% retirees, and we help them understand the logistics of this project, understand and help coordinate plumbers because that's going to be our responsibility, each homeowner from the home down to the street to hook up. Um, as of now, we're still looking at nine to eleven thousand dollars per homeowner. That includes the four thousand that we was just approved last month or the month before, um, and those are twenty-two prices. So who knows? By the time this project is ready, um, keep going. I'm sorry. sorry. Who knows when this project is complete in 24, what the plumbing costs are gonna be. We're figuring between two and 4,000. We've had different county plumbers come out and give us estimates. And right now they're at two to $4,000 to run the line from the house down to the street and hook up and get rid of the septic tank and everything. Um, it's a lot of money. You're looking at, um, in addition to doubling our water bill, um, because we'll have to pay for septic. So when you fill your pool or use sprinkler systems, that's you're, we're going to be billed for that. Now, nobody in the subdivision, none of our neighbors, everybody is pleased that we're able to help with the clean water. You know, let's go ahead and get this done. But it just seems like there's there has to be more money available out there. Um, maybe we should get together and the thought hit me listening to all the other projects that are going on 
talk to the city of Inverness and the city of Crystal River because they've been able to um, get these projects done to little or no cost to the homeowners, whereas ours is quite expensive, especially in this economic climate. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been at it for about two years trying to lobby for additional funds. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Mr. Angola will, you'll be hearing from me and from other folks in our neighborhood. Um, and Dr. Mazzullo, we have sent quite a bit of things to you as well. Um, but if there's anything that I can do, um, I'd like to speak to both of you. I know everybody's asking you for money today, and it's, it's kind of a tedious thing, I'm sure. But um, we really could, our neighborhood really could use additional funds from somewhere, whatever we can do. Thank Th you. Yeah, thank I, you. We understand it's a tough, tough issue. It is. Tough issue. But thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for presenting it. Thank you. Mary Cedar, mental health issues in public schools. Ms. Cedar, are you still here? Yes, you are. You're recognized. My, I'm Mary Cedar. Mm -hmm. You're recognized. Okay, I'm Mary Cedar, and I am just a concerned citizen. I did run for the school board, but I did not win. But I have uh, three concerns among many about mental health care in our public schools. The first one is, um, according to Bay News, every child from pre-kindergarten to 12th grade has to have a me mental health screening every year, and then, then the year after, and the year after, and the year after. And I believe there's a balance. I believe is if a child is displaying mental health issues, okay, help them, but to screen every single child from pre-kindergarten to the 12th grade every year and thereafter is, in my opinion, a bit much. And also, I am concerned from this standpoint of view as a tax-paying citizen. citizen. I'm sorry. I'm trying to speak clearly. Mm -hmm. OK, and the second concern is there's something called the dim YouTube, where a life goes goes in, and he has several students around. And he said to students things like, are you emotionally sure? Is unsure? Is your stomach in knots? Well, I'm your life coach. And at that point, that life coach can talk about anything he wants to with those <coughs> students. Nothing is in writing. It could be, how do you feel about black people, white people, and draw them out in areas where I don't believe is their business. That's just my concern. And the third one is, I took the time and I presented to you um, right out of the Citrus County blogger the goals of the mental health uh, uh, health care workers, and one of which is uh, human diversity. I send before you an apology about what I'm going to say. It is not the school's place to promote human diversity among other people's children. And last, I'm going to finish with a story that I saw on Fox News. A father was suing the school board because his 12-year-old daughter wanted to be, be, try to commit suicide two times because she was told over and over again by the schools that she was a boy, and they gave her human uh, uh, puberty blockers. So I'm concerned that under the mental health care umbrella, can this be happening? So my concern and my I'm asking you to is to ask the state department to, to go over with this with a fine tooth comb. And thank you so much. Thank you. 
Uh, James McKinney, 911 Telecommunications. Mr. McKinney, are you here? I'm sorry I missed you. I, I thought your issue was presented by the sheriff. You're, re you're recognized. Well, good afternoon. Thank you guys for listening. Um, and thank you for guys for what you do for the community, the county, and the state of Florida. My name is James, and I've been with uh, telecommunications for about two years now. My supervisor right here, Ms. Sharon, has been here for about 23 years now. Um, I work at the Citrus County Sheriff's Office and train to take 911 calls and also dispatch uh, for the Citrus County Fire, Inverness Fire, Chris River Fire, and CCSO. I'm here to bring awareness to the job of the 911 telecommunicators and how we are the true first responders. And I'm asking for your support to recognize and include us as first responders in the already existing statute of 112.1815. This inclusion would not change the retirement benefits nor special risks, but would afford us access to the mental health resources that we des desperately need. Our 911 brothers and sisters have similar interactions as police, fire, and EMS. I want you to think of a time that uh, you may need 911 or think of a time that you did call 911. Was your call answered by a certified public telecommunicator with months of hands-on training, a 230-hour course, and a certified by the state of Florida? Someone who calmed you down in your absolute worst time. Got all important information with flawless accuracy as it depends on the safety for you and their job. Your phone number, your address, and what was happening. Provided you with critical life-saving instructions and secured the scene for their EMS fire brothers and EMS brothers and sisters. Now imagine as 911 Next Generation continues to deploy through the state of Florida. And we not only get to hear, but also see uh, these incidents happen. Now, the Florida statute states directly witnessing is seeing or hearing for oneself. So we witness it, we actually hear it for oneself. We get called to the court as a witness for interactions with these callers. And now we'll also face traumatic events visually as well, just as our fire, EMS, and police brothers and sisters. Now, calls where somebody's baby might be dying and we're providing CPR. Someone shooting themselves, not only will hear it, we'll also see it. And injuries on scene of an accident will now be visible. Some of those calls we hear, mothers screaming as their child is dying next to them, we never lose from our memories. Including us as first responders will allow us to get help, just as our fire brother and police brothers and sisters. Suicide in our field is an issue, just as any first responders we witness and hear these events firsthand. And derive, we're deriving the inclusion of first responders through the Homeland Security Act of 2002, Divines first responders as individuals in the early stage of an incident whom are responsible for protection, preservation of life, property, evidence, and environment. During the hurricane, we were activated and we were ready to stand and face that. Luckily, we didn't have to, but some of our brothers and sisters across the state had to be deployed as dispatchers. One of the largest issues with our uh, career is retention. And uh, we have a 20% annual attrition rate and our center at CCSO is actually staffed around 50%. Including us as first responders would help the retention of qualified telecommunicators. There's currently 18 states that have listed 911 dispatchers as first responders, and we're asking you to make Florida the 19th. We carry roughly 10% of the nation's populations, while states like New York, California, Texas, and Georgia have already gotten this done. That population close to doubles during the highest tourism parts of our year. Thank you guys again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. George Reinhardt, uh, uh, representing himself to talk on homelessness. Mr. Reinhardt, you're recognized. Uh, welcome, uh, uh, Blaze uh, Ngoglia to Citrus County. And uh, Ralph Mazzullo, I'm sorry for your father. Thank you. Um, what what I want to address is the homelessness. It's gotten uh, real out of hand. Um, people are living in the forest, and um, uh, ministers are going out to feed them. And it's um, you, you know they're doing their best, but um, no matter where you go, you see people 
uh, with bicycles and backpacks and sleeping bags. And um, uh, I attended the um, governor's uh, um, inauguration. And as you're going through the different counties, you see a lot of homelessness also. And uh, it's a national problem, I realize that. And it's a very hard um, uh, issue to, you know, to grapple with. But um, I just wanted to make you aware of it. Um, I stopped at a gas stop on the way back from Tallahassee. And uh, the people said that, um, you know, the homeless people were going into the bathrooms and living there. And, um, you, you know, it's a big problem. And I just wanted to make you all aware of it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul John Reinhardt, uh, talking on law libraries. You're recognized. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, I uh, enjoyed going up to the inauguration. I got to sit next to the Tucker family. These were the, this was the family of the House Speaker Tucker when I moved to Florida. And they knew the Nixon, the Mixon family that invited me up to Tallahassee back when Spivey and Johnson was sitting in these chairs. So I got to go up there, relive my times up there. But I'm telling you about three things. I want you to support the Florida Recall Initiative District 3 Representative Joel Rudman's first bill um, for Recall Florida. Uh, I've been con in contact with them for about three years. They have about 4,000 people in 67 counties that petitioned our legislatures for the right to recall uh, different county officers and commissioners. Uh, it's kind of like how uh, co they want constitutional uh, counties to be somewhat like uh, charter counties. Uh, this initiative started from Santa Rosa County. It's a recall provision in Florida Statute 100.361 for all non-charted counties. We currently need a Senate companion bill. I also want you to address the free kill law. It should be abolished. It's Florida Statute 768.21, subsection 8. It has to do with medical negligence, and it seems to be without a consequence. Uh, no profession should have a license to kill. The hospital shouldn't either. Uh, if you're a child uh, with no children and no spouse, your parents can't sue. If you're a widower, a widower, widow, a widower, the children can't sue for non-economic damages. This is Florida is the only state that has this, and it and it's not a way to attract seniors here. Also, the law library topic. I'm in a pre-suit investigation for litigation. I'm getting three briefs from three different attorneys. Ultimately, I decide what approach I'll take in my lawsuit. I want to alert you about the possible possibility of massive reversals of both civil and criminal cases because these people are being denied meaningful access to the courts under the First Amendment because the library, law libraries are closing. Um, I, when I took cases up... Uh, I used the courthouse basement here, and I researched my brother's case, got it up to the U.S. Supreme Court for polling. I researched Scott Adams' case for Attorney Cliff Travis, and we did both the appeals court and the Florida Supreme. The books moved from the courthouse basement to the Invis Library to the trash. They have a West computer provided. It just has a basic subscription, so the content is extremely limited. Marion County's law library is set to go away on June 2023 because it was in a special district since 1957. It, they told me it has to do with the governor's decision regarding special districts, the Reedy Creek Disney. So I would appreciate if you guys do something because I was up at the Capitol. You have your own Capitol Branch Library that you could access, but it's under a different funding. It's under the Institute of Museum and Library Services of the state of Florida. And maybe you guys could think of rechanneling that money uh, to do this because there's a lot of seniors, there's a lot of minorities, there's a lot of single moms that are researching their own cases in Marion County. And they asked me to, to approach you guys to see if something could be done. I could leave this with you if you, if you yes, want. That's fine. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Question? Th thank you very much. Robin uh, Orlandi. Uh, Adventure Coast Sierra Club. You're recognized, ma'am.
Thank you. I think we have. I think we have. It. We have it. But thank you. Now we have another one. Representative Mazzullo, Senator Ngoglia, thank you very much for this opportunity to come and talk to you today. Uh, my name is Robin Orlandi. I'm from Dunellen, and I speak today to you on behalf of the Sierra Club Adventure Coast Group, which includes Citrus, Hernando, and Upper Pasco counties. For the coming year, we urge you to focus on three environmental goals. Restore our imperiled springs, invest in land conservation, and promote the adoption of clean energy. We also support Citrus County's 2023 priorities for funding water quality improvements. As we've heard today, we're seeing results and we appreciate your past actions on our behalf. Firstly, please support implementing all of the scientific findings and recommendations of Governor DeSantis's Blue-Green Algae Task Force so that we can stop nutrient pollution at the source and make good on spring restoration projects. This will help to save our iconic but endangered manatees who have no food and increasingly less food due to seagrass die-offs caused by toxic blue-green algae. Secondly, support full funding for the Land Acquisition Trust Fund to protect the Florida Wildlife Corridor and provide habitat for black bears and numerous other plant and animal species who call wilderness their home. Development in our area is increasing, we all know that, so we must balance it by setting aside conservation lands while we have the opportunity and before it's too late. Thirdly, oppose any legislation that would limit the expansion of rooftop solar programs by creating burdens on utility customers. The opportunities are here now with the Inflation Reduction Act. Please don't hamstring local homeowners from investing in clean energy. We wanna do our part as well. And finally, protect the rights of citizens to challenge and continue challenging local land development rules that threaten the environment, quality of life, and biodiversity on our nature coast and throughout Florida. Again, I appreciate this time to speak with you today. Thank you, Nate. Thank you so much. So, a quick question. Yeah. Ma'am? Yes. So where is the, so being that electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles do not pay the same portion of gas tax that gas vehicles pay. Um, and road paving is one of those big things that have to be paid for by gas taxes. Where, where is your chapter on um, additional fees for registering um, electric vehicles to help pay for that? Well, that, that, sir, is outside my area of expertise. We were focused on rooftop solar programs that residents can implement. And I'm, I don't have that information, but we could. But um, the Sierra Club, they do a lot of green energy Sierra initiatives. does, yes. And, and I was going to say, I could go back to our Sierra Florida chair. Oh, and, I can talk uh, get to them. That, I just didn't know if your local chapter information. talking about that. No, that's not one of our priority focuses. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Well, that ends public testimony. Is there anyone else from the public that may want to speak that has not filled out uh, an opportunity through a card? You recognize? Would you please fill out one of these? Actually, you can you can fill it out. Uh, you got one. After hours is twenty dollars. You weren't going to, but you're you're going to now. All right, Ms. Devan, you recognize the abolish abortion. Hi, uh, thank you for letting me speak at the last minute because I was just bigger and I put it in writing. <laughs> um, I guess we've been talking about you know the water, the land. Um, we've been talking about pretty much saving, you know, our our state. Um, not used to talking. Uh, so, um, but anyway, basically what I wanted to say was, you know, we have an issue with abortion. We've been, we have it handled on the federal level. Now it's time for Florida to take a look at what's going on here. We really need to stop what's happening with the children. Um, basically, every moment that goes by that we're waiting, more and more babies are being not only tortured, or not only killed, but tortured 
as they are being put to death. And we have all been, we're all adults, so we've all been, you know, teenagers, children, infants, and we've all been pre-born. We have already have, you know, discrimination against the aged um, and against disabilities. So I would just think we should really start looking at that, uh, consider that, if you would. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else from the public that might have a comment? All right. Well, that ends our public testimony. The only thing left on our agenda is the election of the chair and vice chair for next year. So you just whispered. He goes, oh, are you interested? <laughs> I mean, obviously, I think we're going to we'll alternate every year. Yeah. So with that, I'll make a motion that we alternate every year. That means I get suckered into being the chair next year. And I'll second that. All right. All in favor, that's us. Very good. All right. Any closing comments? No, I'm good. Right. I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank you for your advocacy. It's extremely important for us. And as we continue to work and craft legislation and come up with projects, you're welcome to continue to give us your feedback and your input because we are your representatives. And with that, I'm going to adjourn this meeting of the delegation meeting. I hope you all have a safe rest of the day. And thank you for, again for coming.